for Thursday, July 11th, 2019. Welcome to This Is Only A Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Welcome to this fine Thursday morning. Yes, yeah, Thursday morning for us. I guess it's well, we're recording this day early, but uh, what a what a week! I think we're all out of sorts. I'm Norm. Thanks for joining us. To my left, Jeremy Williams, back from a week long vacation. Hi, Norm. Yeah, I was back. I'm back from Virginia, ah. the East Coast. I thought you were like in the East Bay. No, I went further than that. Okay, kept going. Traveled by air, and mm. I was spent the week with my family and friends in uh, my home state of Virginia. Wonderful. Had a good time. Kishore, welcome as well. Hello. This is this is a this is the first time in three weeks we had all three of us together. I like how we're all drif- enjoying different caffeinated beverages mm-hmm. to ground ourselves. Norm is drinking what I, we call a normal caffeinated beverage. No, no, I have a coffee. I have, no, no, I have tea. I have, oh, tea you have today. Tea. So also a normal caffeine. I'm a little bit out of sorts, as I'm sure you can hear already, because I was sick this whole past weekend. Mm. Uh, it was July 4th weekend, and I was supposed to enjoy the four days, essentially, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I was sick for three out of those four days. So S- I, sick meaning? I had a, a fever? A fever, sweats, oh my. A cough, stuffy nose, Ugh. a baby, all these things. Uh, <laughs> a, so, baby. a baby is now a yeah. symptom. And uh, so I have hot tea, I have a bottle of water, and I have two cough drops. And the goal is to get through this podcast and not cough. I think that's the audience's goal. Too. Okay. I have my normal Diet uh, Coke assortment, but Jeremy always bring in the strange on the coffee. Well, it's whenever my, my grocery store gets a new beverage, I, I want to try it. So this is uh, something called Malk. Yeah, that's right. It's M-A-L-K? called A L K. He's drinking Malk. Ma- <laughs> you know, it, if you add an H in there, then it's basically like chalk. It's got a dairy alternative I've never had before, which is pecan milk. It's soy free. It well, advertises yeah. itself yeah. as soy free. Like not only dairy free, but <laughs> this, the, the dairy alternative <laughs> free. This is the ultimate <laughs> tipster <laughs> drink. It is cold pressed. It's pecan milk, coffee. Pecan milk. Non dairy, no, yeah. and it's milk. No, no, the best I can say about it is that it tastes better than it smells. Oh, is that I a mean, good thing to say? Yeah. I, don't think I, so. I could say the same thing about soy lint. <laughs> tastes yeah. better than it smells. Yeah, no, it doesn't. I think it smells. Yeah, it tastes bad too. Well, it tastes bad as well. I want to congratulate you guys on a good show last week without me confirming everything I've ever. Where's con- the butt? Assumed. You listened to the episode. Which is that I'm completely superfluous to this podcast, and you guys are perfectly good without me. Well, we established the episode before where you were just standing there kind of looking left and right. (laughs) That's canon. That's canon. (laughs) And you guys, I thought it was interesting how we could, you guys and the rest of the internet gave Johnny Ive a eulogy, a free eulogy, just because he left a company. 45 minutes into the podcast, I'm still listening to your first story. Yep. That was uh, a yeah. Was a it was lengthy, momentous. Lengthy talk. We needed to stretch it out. We didn't know how long, how much other tech news there was going to be. Yeah. Well, you did it. You we did, did it. it. You we did talked it. about Apple. Yeah. For quite a bit. Yeah. We're yeah. not going to do that this I, episode. Don't worry. Wait, do you charge for eulogies? What, like a free eulogy Why? is your. Is well, your typically like, someone has to no, die. The charge was free. There is a cost. The you cost. Know. The cost is death. <laughs> a complimentary sure the free is the problem. No, it's not the money, but it is the cost of a eulogy. Okay. Mm. And look, mm. the guy, like, now he's, like, seen what, that, what that'll be like when the day comes. The Grim is that, is that what the it. dream is? The, the dream is, like, Kevin Smith has talked about to this. To see your own eulogy? Where uh, he had a near-death experience with, he had a heart attack. Yeah. Right? And right after he had his heart attack, he, um, you know, the, the near-death experience, you basically got to see your funeral because people came out of the woodworks to... Pay homage, pay tribute, yeah. all the people on the internet. It's like, oh, you know, we would be really sad if you went away. So you basically got to see the appreciation that you otherwise would not have 
if you passed away. It turned his life around. It did, yeah. Yeah, and now we're getting another Kevin Smith movie, Chainsaw Silent Bob Reboot. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we all know what happens after we die. Keanu Reeves told us. Oh, yeah? What, what, I forget. What is it? The people who love us will miss us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what happens. Was that in Bill and Ted's? No, he said he did it on the late, late night show. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a it was a little little bit of a a gem from Keanu. Uh, so what did you guys do? Well, I know you went to Virginia, so presumably you spent time with family yep. this past July fourth weekend. How about you, Kishore? How about you? Uh, my parents were in town, so I spent time with family. Okay. Just at my house. Barbecues, fireworks? There was some grilling. Uh, everyone decided to go to sleep before fireworks. <laughs> So even the awesome. kid, even the kid. How about that? Wow. Not excited about I, the explosions. I usually like fireworks, but I've lived here for a while. Yeah. And we have fog yeah. and you can't see any fireworks. No. So it's yeah. not, there's no point. You, well, you have to go to the marina. Ugh. you have to go somewhere. <laughs> Give me a break. Especially yeah. the marina. Uh, yeah. Stayed in mostly. I think I had a, a nice picnic, spent some time with Gary and Will, um, Twitch partner, Gary Witta. That's right. Oh, we're <laughs> going to talk about that. I don't even know if that fits in pop culture or that fits in tech. But I we're, thought maybe we'll, top story until this top morning. Story. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it sounds like we all had a great July 4th. I got sick, uh, but I did binge a bunch of TV shows, so we'll hopefully get to those uh, in, in pop culture. But let's, th- let's talk about a top story. story this week you know prior to this morning the news dropping this morning i really did not know what we we're going to have as our top story mm-hmm. and i was suspecting it would be some maybe the hbo max talk maybe maybe it would be gary Witta. maybe about twitch streaming and having a little fun but we had some real news some real a real nugget drop this morning uh from nintendo because uh, we're recording this on wednesday of course so you probably know this but nintendo has announced over two years after the release of the switch mm-hmm. highly successful switch the Nintendo Switch Lite. Mm. It's not a successor. It's not going to replace Nintendo Switch, but much like the DS, well, actually, the DS Lite did kind of replace the DS. It became the de facto standard. This is kind of just a, a just a more entry level Switch. I think it's going to replace the Switch. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, well, let's talk oh, about the yeah. differences. It can't. It, well, it absolutely. It can't. I get it's functionally different, but it does I not think have it's functional gonna, parity. I think it's going to replace the Switch. <laughs> so, launches September twentieth. Two hundred dollars, a hundred dollars less. Yeah, good price. Than, than the Switch. All right, that's a fantastic price. We thought the Switch was pretty aggressively priced at three hundred compared to other consoles, compared to tablets. A lot of what people were, you know, where how how else could you spend three hundred dollars? Yep. Two hundred, I think, is you know that's that's a great price point for this. Uh, it is. We think computationally the same. It's probably going to use the same processor. They're, it can't run more games, like Switch games that the Switch can't run. It has, you know, it still runs the, the physical game cartridge. Has a smaller screen. 5.5 instead of like 6.3. 6.2, yep. 6.2. Uh, but still 720. So same resolution. Yeah. So you get same frame rates. It does not have removable Joy-Cons. So fixed controllers. Does have a new... D-pad, a real D-pad, as opposed to just directional buttons. I like that. Just from a usability standpoint, if you're playing in that orientation, I think that makes a lot of sense. The yes. buttons made sense if you take them off and you you need like parity with the two controllers. Right. Right. But since you don't have that feature, this makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Uh, and then, no, because you can't remove the Joy-Cons, there's also no dock. doesn't come with a dock. You can't actually do TV out on this switch i thought that was funny because when they're introducing the the product um he takes it and he walks to the next scene where there's a television and only to illustrate the fact that it doesn't work with one right (laughs) yeah (laughs) which is strange it's it's purely for portability yeah and so i wasn't i wasn't clear on this can it not work at all with a dock or is it just not come with one it it cannot work at all that just seems weird still USB-C. well you can't take the controllers off so no, but I know you could buy more controllers, yeah. And, but yeah. you know, because you can buy Joy Cons to pair with this. That's why I thought that whole functionality is weird. So could you play a two-player multiplayer game on this with one person holding? Oh right, the Switch Lite. Like, do you just need one Joy Con and another person holding one Joy Con or uh, the Switch Pro controller? Yeah. Or if you wanted to put this on a stand, then two Joy Cons would be two small controllers for this 5.5 inch display as your as your tv uh it does have increased battery life 
20, 30 percent more power. Oh, yeah. I wonder about that because now the controllers don't probably, presumably, don't have their own batteries. So mm-hmm. it's all run off a single power source. I wonder how, you know, if that will actually result in about the same or less or more. And then also no rumble. I know. That's the power. thing I probably miss the most. The HD rumble, which probably underutilized in, in the Switch games. Like there was a, there were a few games with a one-two Switch that mm-hmm. really made use of the, the rumble, but nothing so far I've seen really, really and makes that like a very, essential feature. Very few where the controllers are actually attached. They yeah. use that feature. Yeah. And then also no Lava support, obviously, because you can't remove the Joy-Cons. Right. So, so it doesn't have the IR support. Mm-hmm. The IR camera and transmitter. This is a weird device. It's physically smaller, physically more compact. So not much, though. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be the big, the, the make or break for this. Obviously, the cost is a huge factor, right? Uh, but the colors and also the form factor. Looking at it, it I'm, I'm wondering: could we get a 3D print of this just to see what it'd feel like in our hand? Yeah, is it pocketable? The Switch, as it is currently, is not pocketable. I'm sure it'll be on Thingiverse tonight. I respect the the slight skepticism. This is a home run. Oh yeah, this is amazing. Why for the price point which mm-hmm. we mentioned? I think my ninety eight ninety nine percent use case for my Switch has been controllers on handheld, which this meets has better better battery life. Oh, well, wow. okay. Well, it does. I mean. Like I said, it doesn't have as many batteries, and so we don't quite know yet, but you might Yeah, right. I mean, there's some real-world testing, but with a smaller screen, and if it has a similar battery in it, it's going to get better battery life, which is my chief complaint about the Switch overall, mm-hmm. is that battery life just stinks. And the same library. So I'm getting all the functionality that I used most of the time with the Switch for $100 less, and I can get it in turquoise? Sign me up. So I'm, one I'm fe- kidding about the colors. The <laughs> colors are weird. One, one feature that I think is missing from this that they sh- could have put in, and I, I don't know why it wasn't in the original Switch, is Bluetooth audio support. If this is meant to be a real portable version of the Switch, something you're going to put in your pocket mm-hmm. that you might have AirPods or your whatever headphones you might have that has Bluetooth, or on an airplane. Am I wrong in thinking that that does not work well for games, that it works well for TV? and movies, but if there's any kind of latency Why? between input and output, then you have a real problem. That, you, that's, I think that's true for, uh, for VR, but not true for... Well, just Bluetooth has Has lag. a little bit of latency. Right. Yes. Are, are you playing Mario Maker levels with your eyes closed? Is that what's happening here? Is that why you're worried about the latency? I've never noticed that kind of latency. Yeah. No, with, with Bluetooth audio. Yeah, no, I get what you're talking about with games and Bluetooth audio. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, I, I'd be curious. I, I don't, I, I can't believe it's that bad where if you're playing, unless you're playing maybe a fighting game, mm-hmm. that are you, you would enjoy are Breath you, of the Wild as much. Are you saying that you would allow the audio to lag behind the video? Or that, I would al- allow the audio to lag. Yeah. I wouldn't want to sync it up and have video lag. I, I see. Video lag for controls yeah. would, be, would be more of a problem. Right. Yeah. 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 I, don't, I I think the fact that it doesn't hook up to a TV is. Do you you're, use that a lot at home? When like we with, all have switches with, so. with one two switch, we did. Um, Do you play that I game? Pl- I played a th- maybe a quarter of Zelda that way, but mm-hmm. most of it. You're right, ninety percent maybe you know around there. My use case fits the light, but you are missing out on some of the things that made the Switch so interesting, which was it's a home console you can take with you. Now it really is the evolution of the Game Boy. I, I get it, but for a hundred dollar trade off, I think it's worth it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's two games. Yeah. Do you feel like this is going to be a lot of people's second Switch or their first Switch? Do you think more people will buy this as their first Switch or more people will buy this as their s- companion Switch? Well, I think it's the second yes. one for the household. I think it, it's yes to both. I think there's going to be a lot of people that buy the Switch now because at two hundred dollars, it's a really attractive. Who couldn't afford it before? Yeah. Yeah. Who couldn't afford it before? But also, if you have a couple kids. And you have one switch now. Maybe you look at getting one of these as a second investment. Um, I I think it, it it fits both cases. I imagine that it's still going to outsell to people who don't have a switch, mm. just because that's how consoles just work. I've seen a lot of people online say they want they want this. People who have switches they want this because of the colors, because of the extra portability. And I'm like hmm. the colors. Really? 
I think you should wait. And I, I think Nintendo was smart, like because the Switch is boring gray. Although a lot of people have modified their switches and replaced out the the chassis, and that's those are fun and great mods. But they held out on colors until the smaller one. It's almost like an Apple move to to make this light version that much more appealing, more playful. I can't imagine this is the last version of the Switch that will come out. Gary made uh, Witta, and we're going to talk to him about him later this show too, but he made the point this morning on Twitter that there's currently no way to share your library between Switches. You, you can have, restore. You have to transfer. Yeah. So you can't have your all your games on both Switches and only use one at a time right. as you would on a you know a PC or you know, I mean, an, an iOS device. You can tie to your account. I guess iOS device, you can use them on as many as you want as long as it's your account. But the cloud saves. Won't, like Some yeah. games don't support cloud save. Yeah. Yeah. So for, yeah, it's it's it, I guess it's unlike like Apple in that way. Apple would want you to have the iPad and the iPhone and the iPod Touch. Yeah. And Nintendo maybe just wants you to have one device. I think people who have the first gen Switch are happy with it. Probably should hold out and wait for this whatever a, a Switch Pro. What's yeah, that do you, be? you think that would happen? A Switch Pro? I'm, I'm hope I'm holding that. Like beefed up battery, larger screen, 1080p. Or oh, better, even maybe not bigger screen, but better screen. Yeah, yeah, so like higher resolution screen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Better well, processor for that screen. Better. What does the Switch support on television, res wise? 1080p. It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thirty. So that it could potentially do that on a small yeah. screen. Yeah. Um. It could potentially do that, but I think that would drain the battery much too fast. So I think it would have to be a more efficient, like a Switch Pro would probably be more expensive, would have, it wouldn't be, I don't think it, it, it'd be like kind of like PS4 Pro. You're the, you, you, it's not games, it's not like games would not work on the original that would only work on the Pro, but you just get the high resolution or some extra graphic settings. Is there a launch title coming with the um, Switch Lite? I think, um, yeah, is it a, the new the, Zelda. Uh, the, no. Yeah, the remake. Oh, yes, yes, the remake. Yes. Link's no. Awakening? Yes, yes. I, I'm a little surprised at that because, you know, Mario Maker's been such a hit. I'm surprised they didn't just push that back because this is launching in September, right? We're only talking about, like, yeah. six to eight weeks. There's also a special skew that's Pokemon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. I may have sunk in way too many hours into that game. So, Switch, Switch Lite, you're going to buy? No. 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 Only yeah. because I own <laughs> yeah. it. But if I didn't own a Switch, I would 100% buy this in a second. All right, best color then? I don't, again, dude, you don't get the TV hookup. You get some games you can't play. Okay, Mr. I have an extra $100. I'll be playing that. <laughs> I mean, it's 98% of my use case is That's covered true. by this. Yeah. God, if they went the Tesla route, they could uh, let you unlock TV out on the USB C for 50 bucks purchase. Did you get some new games on Tesla yet? I did. I have the racing game. Oh, yeah, yeah? Yeah, uh, I've not played it yet, though. But you play it with the steering wheel? You play it with the steering wheel. Okay. You play the other game with the steering wheel, Pole too. position? Yeah, pole position. I want to see this. Oh, can you All right, we can, do can you go launch. play this so we can film you playing this? Uh, That'll in turn into lot. a meme in a second. Yeah, no. uh, Oh. Just but, like you sitting behind the steering wheel driving a Did Tesla. you see that video? This is a random tangent. Did you see that to the, the video went viral over the 4th of July weekend? What one? Of the, um, the guy and his son in Oculus Quest headsets in the empty parking spot next to, uh, among a, t- a Tesla no. charging station? Yeah, search this. It went like, it was like 60,000 upvotes on Reddit. Hmm. But I, I know the guy, it's Adam Boyce. It's a guy who works at a, in the video games business, but he w- and his family went on a road trip, parked their Tesla at, mm-hmm. a, at a supercharger, and got out of the car, and his wife took a picture of him and his son in Oculus Quest headsets standing next to the car in the empty parking spot. Playing games? Playing games. Yep, living the future. That's, that's 2019. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I want. All right, let's get to pop culture. So we didn't actually talk about this before the podcast. We didn't do some housekeeping. Uh, But should we make this, because all three of us have actually seen Spider-Man Far From Home. And I can't presume that everyone out there listening has seen the film either. So Too soon. we want to talk about the film. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want to talk about spoilers. I want to get your thoughts. So should we save this spoilers for the end, at the end of the show like Fine. we've done in the past? Are you okay with that? Yep. I know we've, we've had 
discussion. We can do it. initial non-spoiler reactions really quick now. Let's do that. Okay, let's do that. So we all saw Spider-Man Far From Home. It made a bunch of money, almost $200 million over six days. The first film to come out, uh, an MCU to come out after Endgame. It kind of bookends Phase 3. They really called it an epilogue. Um, it's, and it's not... It's not phase three anymore. This is the Infinity Saga. I'm um, sorry. Coming book, to it, a conclu- yeah, yeah. concludes the Infinity Saga. Uh, let's get Kishore's thought first. Kishore? This is going to be weird. I might be getting tired of Marvel films. <gasps> what? Just like James Cameron said. Uh, <laughs> like it was good. It was all fine. Like all the boxes were checked. It was just missing like a little extra oomph to me. There, I, I didn't feel that emotionally connected to Spider-Man in this film. Uh, Is it because you're not a 16-year-old boy? <laughs> I just Queens? don't... Uh, like, I, I don't think he transformed as a character uh, in, in this movie. And so it just didn't resonate. Like, again, everything was there. There was a little bit of humor. There was a lot of action. I enjoyed the villain. Uh, the How it connected to the larger world made sense to me. All of those things, like were there but it didn't sum up to something greater i felt a little fatigued to be honest hmm. wow i all right i kind of hate myself I, I for didn't, that I, review i didn't um i didn't expect that from you kishore how about you jeremy i, I don't want to get too deep into it without going into spoilers but i'll just say that i liked it it was fine i had a good time uh yeah it's you know it's, it's what i expected it would be yeah we're in a similar place you know what i too am in a similar place I enjoyed it. I thought it was fine. I don't need to see it again in theaters. Yeah. Even though I'm sure there are some things that would benefit from a second viewing. But I enjoyed it, man. I think it was a good movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's so hard to compare. We've had three MCU movies already this year, and the year is just half over. Mm -hmm. And there won't be any more this year. You know, we have Star Wars and and Disney animated films for the rest of the year. Uh, but of the three MCU movies to come out this year, third best. Oh, yeah, easily. <clears throat> However, it may be the best post credit stinger. Oh, wow. What right? a tease. Most intriguing. Po- Mid credits and post credits. Yes. yes. Yeah. Stay for the credits, guys. All right. Uh, we'll save our spoiler discussion from uh, Far From Home to the very end. And we'll also change the light behind us. So if you're jumping and watching the video, you'll be able to know. Uh, when that is. Something else that dropped this past uh, holiday weekend and that more than 40 million households watched Stranger Things yes. Season 3. Yes. You could not have been more excited. So, Jeremy, yes. your thoughts. <laughs> well, I've only watched the first episode. I'm going to try to pace myself, you know, like because you get you want to watch them, watch them, watch them. But you, it's been so long since we've had Stranger Things, and I want to enjoy year? it. Was it a year and a half? A year and a half. And I just want to... It wasn't... Was it a year and a half, or was it more than that? What, was it a Halloween release last I think it was a Halloween scene? release. So yeah, a year and a half. Year and a half. So I am very happy to see this. However, there are some changes. And I guess we don't want to go into too many spoilers here either. No, we But don't. I will say, like, in the first five minutes, you realize this budget is on a completely different scale. This is a whole new level of money spent on Stranger Things. That machine that we see in the first act. That's CG, though. Exactly. Yeah. Good CG. But budget. like good CG. And there's a lot of CG in this episode. Yeah, there's a lot of CG in the season. And it's all very realistic. It's not cartoony. It's not on a, t- on a computer screen. This is meant to look like realism. And it's, yeah. it's well done and it's expensive. And also, you, there's, n- there's a new energy from the actors. Like, oh. I feel like they are now being shot and they are confident and celebrities and they're, they're a bigger deal than they were in the first two seasons. You're talking about the adults or the kids? The kids. The kids. Well, they're, they're older now. The adults are all professional, and they're all like they're all actors, and they do a great. And, like they are pretty much consistent because they yeah. have the same kind of level of notoriety. Probably they have more so now, but they don't show that. The kids, I feel like they do. I feel like they're a little more, mm, you know, they're just a little more proud of themselves in a way, and not as, mm, you know, like concerned about being a kid. They're they're more confident, which is it has its good things and its bad things. Well, they they are older. And I think that's the striking thing, the most striking thing about this season, um, compared to especially the first season. The first season opened with that now, you know, iconic D&D scene. Yeah. And how do you capture that magic, the camaraderie of growing up in the 80s three years later? It's set in 1984 now. 
right? Is no, right? It, it starts in 84. Oh, that's right. The opening scene's 84. It's in 85. Oh, it's, okay. One year later. Totally different landscape. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but in 85, the mall is the big thing in the season. Right? Yeah. And there was JT's of the first trailer, and it turns out the mall isn't like... They spent the, the world building of recreating the, the, the 80s is in full force. The production design of what they did to this mall. I don't know what space they bought, but it isn't just like a one-shot camera, one-shot location. It is a character in the season, the Starcourt Mall, uh, from the, the restaurants, the hot dog on the sticks, to the, the Orange Julius's, to the, the clothing stores, the Gap, the Sam Goodies. It's everything. There's got to be an arcade in there, right? There's no arcade in the mall. Are you sure? How do you There's know this already? Have you watched I've the watched whole thing? I watched the whole season. <gasps> I watched the whole season in like two days. I was sick. I was in bed. <laughs> what would I do? Sick, quote Stranger unquote. Things. So you could. It's not a spoiler watch. to say uh, the arcade that was the setting, like the kind of strip mall, middle of nowhere, not strip mall, but like middle, of, like you know, middle of small town yeah. arcade. Uh, that is its own location. That is not in the mall. There is a movie theater uh, in the mall. You know what's cool about that is you forget how. Poor movie theaters used to look like those seats look uncomfortable. Yeah, they are just like crammed together. They are cheap felt seats, and oh, you kids have it so they, lucky. They nailed that with your Dolby Vision and your your IMAX seats and your recliners and yeah. your reserved seating. Yeah, I it made me even like as a child of the '90s remember growing up and going to like the local mall theater, and it was those like weird like, like like real bad cloth seats mm-hmm. that that were rickety with the wooden wooden yeah. sides it was a little better than sitting on the floor yeah and, and everyone was like really squished together and the screen was real small and like <laughs> yeah. they, they weren't like, like the, you know, it wasn't like the stadium seating that you have now right it was basically like a long like the the worst seat in the house was probably not better than having you know like a, a a 36 inch tv in your living room right but of course no one had that like no one had it was that. 19 that's, that's right that's right and so the mall is fantastic. Like if you, it, just as just as the world building, uh, and, and it plays a role. You said it's a character, but it also plays a plot role too. At least well, in the that's, first what, episode. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's 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 a it's a huge part of the story. They make great use of it. I think a lot of the problems I had with the second season, with um, the, the side tracking mm-hmm. of some of the characters, they do less of that this season. Hmm. I do think that there are so many characters out in the Stranger Things. They pair them up in interesting ways and have. They, they do have, like, groups of kids go off on their separate missions, and then everyone comes back together. That format still works. The the monster, because there is a monster, mm-hmm. I think it's fantastic and is not spoiled in any of the trailers. Oh, that's good. So, like, I'm two episodes in or, like, an episode and a half, and there's something about it that feels a little repetitive about the problem. It's like there's somebody trying to, uh, you know, manipulate the upside down. Like, it feels... Uh, just like a return. What evil organization is yeah. it this time? And and that actually I found disappointing because they left this incredible hook in, was it season two with the other 11s? Oh, yeah. With that one episode. Yeah. That they haven't done anything with. I'm well, like, now, what hold is on. going on? I, don't spoil this for us. I, I'm hoping that they do go into that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm anyways. not going to say anything. Good. Yeah. I'll let you guys watch the season. Uh, what was the one thing I did want to say one thing and you did see if you saw the first episode you, you saw the character but they do homages right there's there's movie references the second season had a very clear Ghostbusters homage like they, the kids love Ghostbusters they dress up as the four Ghostbusters for Halloween um, and there are a lot of references whether it's quoting movies whether it's seeing movie posters in the background where the kids watching the movies in season three and the music is obviously great but there's one explicit reference with a character in this film to the Terminator, who's basically a personification of the Terminator mm-hmm. with the casting, with the acting that I thought was spot on and I enjoyed the spit out of it. Mm. And, and it's, it's, a, it's not a spoiler. It's a minor character, but it's, it's there. Too much 80s? No. Oh, no, dude. No. I, no. <laughs> no. I, I'm not asking you okay. that question. I'm just saying like, every moment I've watched of, of my one episode, I'm just I'm loving it. Every shot is just beautiful. The music is fantastic. It feels like you're in the 80s, and it's, uh, I'm just, I, they're really knocking it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. All right. So let's go from the 1980s to the 2380s, or maybe even further, 20, 24th century. Uh, we got some Picard info, and I actually haven't seen this yet, sure. So just this morning, just minutes before we started uh, recording, a poster 
before the new Picard series dropped, and there is a minor spoiler in it, but oh I think gosh. it's worth discussing. I'm clicking. Three, two, right, one, I'm click. clicking now. <laughs> this is on uh, Patrick Stewart's Twitter, and it is Picard in a on a vineyard, and he has a dog. He has a dog. There's a dog in this show. Does that mean something to you? No, but I'm just saying that's the, we have is, another character. Is that I mean, the spoiler? Yeah, that's the spoiler. <laughs> dog. The, the dog has dog a spoiler. clearly photoshopped dog tag. Dude, look at that dog but tag. It's a but it's Federation. a Federation logo. That's pretty good. I'm sure uh, R.I.P. Think Geek. I was going to say Think Geek was going to have a have that for sale tomorrow, but R.I.P. Think Geek. Uh, Picard is not wearing a S- Starfleet uniform. He has a jacket on. Mm-hmm. It looks like he Pens has the, the red dicky, though. Does he? Yeah, it looks like it. The turtleneck. Uh, he, it, oh, whoa. That is a keen observation. The card underneath his jacket does look like he's wearing some sweater of sorts and less like a next generation um, uniform, but more like the, the kind of rib collar that you saw almost Shatner and crew wear in the, the original series. Not that this has any tie-in, but maybe just a... A visual flourish that's that's a reference to that universe. I like it. He's a, he has a dog. It's Picard with a dog. It is, yeah. All day long. Give I, this to me. I wonder, do you think it's going to be all like a practical dog? <laughs> like a real I think dog? think it's going to be a practical dog. You do? Dog. You don't think it's going to be a CG dog? All right, good. So. Well, Picard's a dog person. Dado's a cat person. It's not the first dog we've seen in Star Trek. Archer had a dog. His famous Beagle, which was referenced in the 2009 movie. Uh, I think Picard's going to be at uh, Comic-Con next week, and, uh, along with CBS Discoveries, uh, or CBS All Access and Star Trek Discovery, so we'll hopefully see a trailer, is my hope, oh my. next week. Oh, man. That would be that I would wish be cool. I could watch you watch that trailer. Should I wait? No, I'm not going to wait. <laughs> no way. Nick Ashore? I'm not waiting let's get a, for Let's him. get a camera, and let's film my reaction to that trailer <laughs> next week. Wait. Well, 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 if we get a chance to record a podcast next week at uh, Comic-Con... Uh, we'll watch that trailer live as part of the podcast. Maybe, maybe we'll do that. All right. Uh, next up, this is kind of big news. So streaming services are everywhere now, and every media company has kind of launched their own. And the big media conglomerates are really kind of struggling to fight against the, some of the, the big first, like you know, the Netflixes and, and even the, the Amazon Primes out there. So uh, Warner, or AT&T Warner, which not only owns CW, all the DC stuff, but also HBO, has been working on their own streaming service for the longest time. This is their Disney Plus competitor, their Netflix alternative. This is going to be the big flagship one. And they announced the name of it this week, and it is super confusing. It's lame. Because it's going to launch next year with Mm -hmm. early access, some, some preview this year, and it's called HBO Max. Okay. What? So there's HBO Go, HBO Now, <laughs> and HBO Max. But and HBO Max o- is not a version of HBO. It's not. And they it's also not. own Cinemax, too. So, But this is not that. It's not like HBO with everything? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is it? Like what it, it, all different stuff? What it looks like to me, it's all different. It's everything under this umbrella that AT&T Warner owns now. And won't even... So my question was, okay, just the name HBO Max, one, it's clear that and they said as much, they chose this because of the brand recognition of HBO. People love the idea of HBO, and they're accustomed to paying for HBO. I'm going to cough for a second. Excuse me. No, no, it happened. <coughs> He's losing it. Yeah, I mean, so you get the... The name, I, the brand of HBO, but yeah. you get the larger library of old content. But it's, so it makes me think, okay, is this a superset of HBO? Like currently you pay 15 bucks a month for HBO content. I know and trust that I'm going to get not only some great HBO reliable series, but also new experimental, experimental stuff like Chernobyl, some limited series like uh, The Big Little Lies, um, you're going to get John Oliver, like Game of Thrones. That that kind of stuff is already in the whole old existing library of HBO. That's why I'm paying $15 a month for, which admittedly is a lot compared to what you get on like Netflix. But it's that the quality is what I've, 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 I've been paying for. So my immediate thought is HBO Max, this must be 
everything in HBO bundled in. Plus, I'm getting like they announced they obviously have the rights to the friend the Friends show, right? Mm. They're pulling Friends from Netflix, and it's going to be part of exclusively a part of HBO Max. Okay. Great. So it is HBO and no, then no. Some. So that's what I thought, mm-hmm. right? That it must be. It must be the super set. Yeah. Like and and, they, and then some new original programming they have announced. They they have announced things with Anna Kendrick. They we'll, announced... we'll go through the original programming in a second. So I'm like, okay, that must be. But reading into it, it looks like no, it's not. It's going to live alongside HBO, which will still exist not only as a cable subscription service, which you can get with Comcast and. Uh, um, time, uh, time Warner or whatever, but you can also uh, buy with HBO Go or HBO Now. It will live alongside that, and it won't even have all the HBO stuff. But it will have some. It'll have some <laughs> HBO it'll, stuff. Old HBO stuff. Like, yeah. It'll be more of like the library of old shows as opposed to the new stuff. But I'm assuming there's going to be some super plan that comes out that will be everything and everything together. And it just matters how much it is because we didn't get pricing details. Let's see if the new shows they're producing hook you. Because, yes, they have friends. Yes, maybe they'll have, you know, like Six Feet Under and Curb Your Enthusiasm and stuff like that. They didn't announce that. But um, I'm just suggesting what it could be. Let's see if the new shows hook you. Yeah. Dune, The Sisterhood. Oh, this is is tearing me apart because this is something I presume previously would be a core HBO show. Yep. And it's directed by Dennis Villeneuve, who it, is amazing. He's show running it. This is tied to the movie he's making, the Dune movie. And it's in that universe. And he's setting the visual tone, much like um, for House of Cards, when um, David Fincher directed the first episode, the pilot, or Martin Scorsese did for uh, Borok Empire. So I'm excited for that. Uh, <laughs> did you not get enough of the Big Bang Theory? Because Kaylee Cuoco is back. And this time it's a murder mystery. Called Very popular. The, the Flight Attendant. <laughs> a one-hour thriller. Skip that. Okay, Jeremy, this one's for you. Mm-hmm. How about a Gremlins prequel? Oh, yeah. Gremlins Secret of the Mogwai. Okay. All right, so it's an animated series? Uh, yes. All right. Takes place in 1920s Shanghai. Warner Brothers and Amblin. All right. Yeah, that sounds great. An Anna Kendrick-centered... Um, a series, it looks like it's like an anthology type series um, where there's going to be a different main character every year, very rom com I'm actually in on this, um, called Love Life. Uh, and then a lot of garbage. So, <laughs> wait, is the Anna Kendrick thing, that's a movie? That's a, uh, it's going to be one season I'll and see. then it'll be a different, oh, kind of like True a, Detective, I'll like see. a different cast gotcha. the next there, year. There's a lack of clarity on this, which is problem number one, right? There's... It's not very clear how this will live alongside HBO, what the crossover of content will be, or even if, you know, it, I may be wrong. It may be that everything on HBO will live under here. The problem, if, if that's the case, right, which would make the most sense from a consumer standpoint in terms of simplicity, buy this new one thing that has all the HBO you love, by announcing these new shows, is that to say that that would be the new HBO slate? Because that's separate than when HBO has its slate of we're doing this Watchmen series, we're doing these, uh, the, you know, the 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 that uh, the Pope series. Um, like, there's a certain type of show that I expect from HBO that I don't think is a Netflix style you know, mass market show. Maybe this is why the head of HBO left. It could be. I, I think this is pretty disappointing because it's also going to be expensive as hell. You think so? Well, because they have to make it as expensive as the HBO service, right? That's 15 bucks. So this is going to be more than 15 bucks, I'm betting. Yeah, and Disney Plus is almost half that. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Disney Plus, they went explicitly underpricing while having a huge library of IP and also these new valuable, valuable I mean, uh, Marvel shows that they're producing. Warner has a huge library, and is, is Friends really worth that much? Why are they making such a big deal of Friends? It, because it is one of the most watched shows on Netflix. It is? That and The Office. Well, The Office, I get. <laughs> I just don't, I've never but understood is it one the of the most of watched shows on Netflix because people already bought into Netflix? That's what I think. Is they have Netflix, and they're like, what do I feel like watching? I'll watch an old episode of Friends. And but that's they're not they didn't buy Netflix to watch Friends. 
there, there's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, this is where the data can't tell you everything. Will I be able to watch every episode of Fraggle Rock? Oh, good question. Okay. You can't do that right now on HBO? Bill? I don't know. I think you I can. Think you can. I think you can. Yeah. Already? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. What I hope is that if they have this as two separate services, an HBO Max and an HBO Go, it, one, it's going to suck for people who like want to watch the Dune series and previously would have expected that on HBO, the, the core HBO series. I hope it's not taking resources away from that core HBO series because you're going to get... It definitely is. I, I know it definitely is. But then it feels like you're going to get, you're paying the same amount, that 15 bucks a month. But I don't, I don't want one, the quantity or quality of that content to diminish. And two, you have to make a choice. Like I'm, I would be happy to stick with the current HBO if I know this is the content I'm be, I'll, I'll be getting. The past, if the past 10 years of HBO is what I can expect from the next 10 years of HBO, take my money. But if they're fragmenting it, that's going to put me in a tougher position, especially with the other options from Apple and Disney coming out. We're just going to eventually just sign up for cable again. <laughs> it's going to get so expensive. The bundle. you got to buy yeah, the bundle. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The same thing. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So on Netflix, uh, the other big news is a new Netflix animated show got announced this week. Mm. And it is based on the popular Tesla, Tesla game, game <laughs> Cuphead. Beat you to it. Are we... Out of ideas overall when no, it comes to original, making that, shows? No, that's a, it's we never been a show. out of ideas. My, I'm well, really like, Let's talk about all the successful video game TV adaptions that, are, that oh, have been that's made. That's not fair. fair. Yeah, it's totally fair. That's exactly what this is. Second of all, beyond <laughs> the fact that it's a video game adaptation, which never works... <laughs> It is also an, a reversion to 1940s yeah. animation, which we also have that no one watches anymore. So, like, what is this going to be centered on? Is a bunch of people – is Cuphead just going to die, like, every every few minutes like it is, like, when you're playing the game? Well, like, first it's just of all, really first of all, hard? sure, it was 1930s Thank oh, you. Sorry. animation, not 1940s. Give, I retract my entire screen. <laughs> my fear for this is the, the cost to making this animated show, right? Cuphead – was famous for how expensive the animation style took. You can't cheat your way with CG for a lot of the stuff. Well, so to but ma- the, the game was at 60 hertz. This only has to be at 12. So maybe that's cheaper. Yeah. But there will yeah. be less looping. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and what, what the story is going to be, right? Like, and I love the animation style, and I want to see. I would want to see a movie, I guess, first, then an ongoing series. If they announce this as here's a 90 minute Cuphead special, all in. But <laughs> as an ongoing series, I'm, I'm I'm not so sure. Yeah, I. You know what though? <laughs> I am not good at Cuphead, so I did not play a whole lot of it. It's notoriously difficult, but I loved the animation style, and that's the hook that everybody saw when before it came out. That's why everyone was excited for it. And so that here you get to do watch the animation style. Just watch those 30s. and the music. Don't forget yeah, and the music and the music. You don't have to deal with the difficulty level. Maybe it's. I hope it's not an inter- interactive. Oh, that would be amazing! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> wow. And it's not. It's going to be like we said, less loopy. So it's going to be lots of variety all the time. I'm excited for this. Do you, have either of you watched the uh, Mickey Mouse animated shorts? They're they're still being produced and put on um, whatever Disney Channel is called now. Oh, I saw some when I went to Disney World because they had them on uh, televisions in the They're hotel. They're really good. What are you yeah, talking about? They are. They you look know, good. Disney's, Disney Animation Studios is still making animated shorts uh-huh. starring Mickey Mouse okay. and, and, and company. Yeah. And they're like in the traditional style of okay. like five to ten minute long vignettes. But they look incredible. And it's like the, the, the current take of Mickey, right? It's the stylized, like it's the modern it's style of Mickey. It's not Steamboat Willie Mickey. But it's, 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 I think it has its charm. It's not like over aggressively, you know, 90s Mickey or no, something. No, it's not gritty Mickey no, who's no, no, like no, no. tough and no. lived on the streets or anything it like that. It has a timeless look to it. Okay. Um, I think not enough people are watching those because they're very tightly, <coughs> excuse me, tightly written. I think they're playing on a loop at every <laughs> Disney hotel. So... I think a lot of people are watching those. I watched it somewhere. Was it like a Disney cruise? Indiana Jones, like the ride, like there's a waiting room and we had to wait. Didn't did they show us Mickey cartoons there? I don't know. I feel like I have seen what you're talking about. New updated, but old yeah. classic character. Have you seen the Steamboat Willie Lego set? No. no. Yeah, dude, it's black and white. It's awesome. 
Oh, huh? that sounds cool. Yeah. Actually, and it's a boat, right? So that's got to be cool. It's a boat, although I don't know if it actually floats. Someone's tried to combine that with a, a ship in a bottle. Have Steamboat Willie <laughs> in a bottle. <laughs> that would be a good mashup. Um, sticking with Disney, we had the uh, release of the first trailer for Mulan, the live action mm-hmm. Disney a- adaptation. You were asking about ideas? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> did you guys see this? I did see this. And I loved it. I loved it too. It uh, looks so good. It, really? It makes sense. Like, not not all of the adaptations were great. I understand Aladdin's made like $300 million at the box office or whatever. That one never made sense to me. Lion King makes sense. It is a David Attenborough film with a Disney <laughs> styling. Mulan is a war movie. Yeah. Um, with like an incredible heroine and a family drama behind it. I thought the trailer looked incredible. The action scenes uh, seem like, e- even though they're, they're sort of, um, we get quick cuts of them, look like they're going to be beautiful. It's not going to be like the, um, the epic that we saw with like Crouching Tiger kind of style, but I think it's going to have more heart to it. Yeah. Like, like the big question I have is going to be on the choreography and um, how the action scenes are, are directed. Um, it was It's directed by Nikki Caro, who directed Whale Rider. She's from New Zealand. And I know that uh, What a Workshop did uh, the weapons and costumes for this. So it's going to look fantastic. Uh, the cast looks great. Um, you know, if you look on Wikipedia, it's Donnie Yen, it's Jet Li. So um, many Gong recognizable Lee. people. Really? And yeah. it's, it's performed in English, but I'm really curious, oh. like, will they do, like, a Chinese dub of it with those same actors? Because sometimes overseas, even, like, if they film a movie in Chinese, they'll redub it for another dialect in Chinese with the same actor and just perform it again. And uh, the audiences don't care because... You know, it's still the same actor, even though. What do you mean they perform moving. it again? So they do ADR. They do ADR, but it's still their voice. Yeah. But they dub it in just another Chinese, yeah. right, another dialect. Yeah. And audiences don't mind. They'll watch it in either version. This looks great. I did, did not watch this. Do you? Do you, does it bother you? There's no Mushu. So this is the the, the kind of boring online controversy yeah. because there are a lot of people who are like up in arms because one, there is no Mushu. No Eddie Murphy dragon character, which appears like the reports are it's replaced by a phoenix. Yeah, I think there's there's a some sort of fire creature. Yep. And two, uh, the music. There's no songs in this. So unlike Aladdin, unlike Beauty really? and the Beast, there will be no sing-alongs hmm. for this. Uh, and what they have said is that the music, the score, will take cues from yeah. some of the songs, but you just won't have the words. So you'll hear some of the... The cues, you'll recognize a few of the things in the score, but they're going to play it mostly straight. And I think that's the right way to play oh, right. this movie, to play it straight. Now, Play up the family drama, play up the war. Yep. I, but I go, also go back to, you know, I can't wait to see what the action choreography is going to be on this. Because if you think about the Mulan character, not the Disney, because Mulan is a historical character. It is... That, that character, like Joan of Arc, has been portrayed many times on screen, and especially in Asian cinema. There are a bunch of, like, basically Mulan stories, and a lot of those have been directed by um, some very notable Hong Kong directors. And there are some great, just like um, uh, uh, the director of um, Hero and uh, even The Great Wall, uh, like, has, has done, like, some really beautiful like, war epics. I wonder if this is going to match that type of Asian uh, war epic movie. Because if this has any, if this is anything like Hero, or or even like um, not Crouching Tiger, but uh, uh, what is that? Uh, House of a Thousand Daggers, House of Flying Daggers, uh, then all in, all in. Very excited for this. The trailer makes it look like a something that parents would go watch, you know, after the kids have a babysitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very excited. Um, moving on. Okay, we're gonna talk some theme parks. So. Two big theme park things I want to talk about. One, Universal Studios has a soft opening for its revamped Jurassic Park, The Ride. Oh, that was cool. And that's exactly... Jeremy's watching the video right now. So, uh, Slash Film, uh, I think their editor-in-chief um, has a has a, a YouTube channel called Ordinary Ventures, where I think he and his wife go on basically theme park rides and film them and talk about their experiences. And... They film <laughs> their experience through the new Jurassic Park ride. This the is revamp. so good looking. And but no one's wearing 3D glasses. That's the thing. Okay, describe what you're watching, Jeremy. 
Well, <clears throat> people are in a, what do you call these kind of rides? A dark the, ride where you're in a car and... You, well, have you done the Jurassic Park ride? It's the original boat? one? It, isn't, aren't you in a boat? You're in a boat. You're in a raft. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a small world and you're in a raft and you've probably got 10 people in it and they're going into a structure which is on the side of an aquarium. Yep. <clears throat> ostensibly. But the, it's actually a screen. You see a shark and then the big dinosaur from Jurassic. The underwater. Yeah. Yeah. It swims up and it eats the shark. And what's awesome is it splashes its aquarium and water comes out of the top of 4D it. 4D effect Onto the boat. Yes. Which is, that's awesome thinking. Yes. I, that's, that's why I said that's super cool. But... This will not look realistic if those are television screens. Like, this is the right. kind of thing you could easily film if it were, and it would look great. But once you get in there with your two eyes and you see that it's not stereo, it wouldn't be convincing. But the boat is on a track, and he, the, the view from the camera here is mm -hmm. getting parallax, is getting depth. Yeah, no, you're right. I could see that. So, and I mean, how was that happening? Explain this to I, me. And, and it's not like they put like a polarized filter or yeah, like some yeah, 3D yeah. glasses over this camera. It, it could be like a lenticular screen, but I don't imagine that would no. work. No, there's no glare coming off the screen either. Which how I are find they weird. superimposing this dinosaur scene behind this giant wall of, yeah. you know, quote unquote glass, whether it's a display or not? Is it some type of Pepper's Ghost effect? Oh. I wonder if they're actually using real glass to create some lensing. They looked really translu um, um, opaque. opaque. Yeah, so I don't think that that's Pepper's Ghost. But you're getting a real... I mean, because the, 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 the boat is moving along a track and you're seeing multiple windows into this aquarium, You can, and, and people moving their heads presumably can kind of look around inside it. How are they simulating the dinosaur where you do get parallax? Yeah. Do they talk about that? No. <laughs> I don't know, okay. Maybe I got to do the ride. Yeah, okay. maybe you got to do it. Where is it? It's the Universal Studios. Um, LA? I think uh, Florida first. Okay. I want to say, uh, but I think LA, they're being revamped, both the LA and Florida ones. And so opening soon. I love that ride. Growing up as a child of the '90s, like that was the thing. That was a that was a Michelin four star experience. Really? Like travel to that country to do that ride. Travel to Hollywood yeah, to do that like ride. Yeah, like the T-Rex coming out right before you like go splashing down. It's yeah. great. Yeah, I've 84 never, foot drop. I never did this. You, you never, have you I, been to Universal Studios? Uh, yeah, we went to the one in LA like a year ago, but I didn't do that ride. This was like- one I don't of remember it being at in LA. It, it's I, in I, LA. Oh, it 100%. No, I think last year it wasn't oh, open. Oh, maybe it wasn't open. I think it was under construction. Yeah. Uh, I went on the the old school one in Orlando um, mm -hmm. at Spring Break. It was it was all those things I remember about. Hmm. I mean, the thing that Universal did with their rides because they were all IP based, right? Like their rides are all based on movies. Uh, with the Back to the Future one and with the Jurassic Park one, was they wanted to make you feel like you were going th into the universe, all right? So the Jurassic Park ride back in the nineties was such that you were actually going into Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Right, and the the queue would have safety screens and all the kind of like safety information videos to make you feel like you're waiting in line to go to Jurassic Park. And once you got on that boat, you actually the boat goes through the gates of Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. They had animatronic dinosaurs that da, you'd da, see da, in the pens. Da, da. There was a whole effect where a giant dinosaur would come out of the water and kind of push the boat off course into the more dangerous areas. And then you go into the facility where things have gone wrong, and then you have a giant animatronic T Rex come at you right before, like Shore said you fall um, 84 feet into the splash zone. To really sell that, they should make you sign a disclaimer. Oh. <laughs> Before you enter Jurassic Park. Yeah. Will that hold up the queue or <laughs> that shorten the queue? Exactly. Good question. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I want to do that. The other ride video from the same YouTube channel, I think Ordinary Adventures, again, is the name of the YouTube channel, uh, is a Smuggler's Run video. And this is the Star Wars ride. The, I don't want to watch this. Wait. This is the Falcon? The Falcon. This is video this. from the Falcon ride. No. So it's it's up to you. You are right. Yeah. You, maybe you shouldn't watch it. But here's the interesting thing. We've we've heard about the Falcon ride, right? We've talked about it on the show. It's a ride where you get to control and fly the Falcon. Well, everybody does, and everyone plays a different role. Exactly. They did, they filmed a ride through of this where intentionally... Mm -hmm. Them and none of the other passengers touched any of the controls oh. to see what would happen. Wow. That's an expensive proposition because you have to wait in line a long time, I would imagine. It was worth it for their, to make the video. Okay. Uh, and I won't spoil it if you don't want to watch it, but they have the, the full ride. It's funny. It's like Unreal Engine powered. I, it's like... 
I started watching it and I regretted it immediately. <gasps> and I so I, I was like, shut it off. Because, like, I don't want any of the story. Okay, but here's the thing. Like, if I go to see Hamilton, I want to know that music. I want to have the soundtrack, like, in my you head. You know this right? story, right, though. But, you know what's because happening. Because it's like, a, I'm, I might not do this again. And so here I am. I'm in the Falcon. And do I really want to spend time getting acquainted with how it looks and taking in those details? Or do I want to you know what I want to do? You've spent 40 years of your life getting <laughs> acquainted with the Millennium Falcon. This is not a... Uh, a I need to learn up. Like, what do you mean? What is hyperspace? Like, you know everything already. I get overwhelmed. It should be intuition. It should be a galaxy. What is quest. that? What they is that modeled ca- these based on your actions, Jeremy, exactly. as a child, and you're pressing <laughs> the buttons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. I some part of me thinks that I, when I get in there, I want to be able to take advantage of it, not discover things so much. But on the other hand, you're right. The discovery would be so much more compelling. I think the only answer is writing it twice. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're coming at it from the perspective of only being able to write it the once, yeah, and not having the time to go multiple times. But if you had the option to write it ten times in a row, then of course you want to go down, go in cold the yes, very first time. Absolutely. So treat it that way. You okay. have plenty of life ahead of you, Jeremy. I, I, hope I so. wonder how they're going to simulate some of the effects, like how this ride works. Like obviously, there's got to be screens around the cockpit and all of that stuff. But I'm kind of wondering if they spin you to simulate. Like going to hyperspace or like no, accelerating no, no. and slowing it, down. It's not. It's don't not like mission, mission Earth. How do you know? No, I don't think it's going to be that intense like Mission Earth, where they're like spinning you to feel the genes. Yeah. Uh, but there has to be. It, it, I don't think it's Back to the Future either, where you're just going just on a a, a, a small gi- like gimbal gimbal-y type yeah. of thing. So I think it must be. There must be some motion that you're going through because otherwise, why design it as these cockpits? where they have multiple ones going through. I mean, obviously that's throughput, but I have a feeling that thing is moving a lot more than we think. Mm. Well, I, I won't spoil the details of what you see in the ride, but I will say from their experience, from their test of going through the ride without pressing any buttons, mm-hmm. and you actually still have a ride. Oh, yeah. I'm like sure. They, the, the, the Imagineers if... have imagined this, have planned for the scenario, and you actually get to see through a bunch of sequences. Uh, you know what? I'll never do that. Like, no group I'm with will ever do yeah, that. Yeah, of course. So once I write the right, I'll watch this. Can you t- at least tell me, is it funny? I would expect it to be funny. I would what do ex- you mean? The ride itself? Like, I like would expect the, the, the if you writing, touch or? nothing, if you do nothing, you're yeah. clearly, like, you're just trolling the game. And the game would recognize that and, mm. and say, say things. No? Not, not really. Okay. Yeah. No. All right. They take it always in universe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um... And that basically does it for pop culture. We will say next week uh, we're going to be on location. Um, the team is going to be actually in different locations because we have most of the tested team in D.C. Uh, for Apollo 50, 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 moon landing. Uh, but sure, you and I will be celebrating that in San Diego with a couple hundred thousand of our friends at San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, I want to be clear on one thing. <laughs> They're not this, all his friends. This is, I wish I was in D.C. on some level. Like that is a once in a lifetime event. And I'm super excited to go back to San Diego. It's been a couple years, and I think it's going to be a different kind of San Diego. Um, I think we're looking for suggestions for things to do. I get in Friday, and I'm there through Sunday. I'm on a one Spider-Man panel. But we have a much more, because uh, we're not doing, there's not incognitos and stuff, there's a much more sort of open schedule that we have. So if people have suggestions of things to check out, I, I think definitely hit us up. Uh, Return to Marvel this year. They are back. Are you excited about that? Yes. I, I don't know. It's a question what of feel. whether the footage they're going to share, if they share any footage or in, in, information, I'm always glad to have. I mean, there's a Kevin Feige 5 p.m. Saturday evening fireside chat panel. Mm. No details except Kevin Feige, which means they're probably going to unveil a couple. They're going to roll out the black fans. And- yeah. But I, I would think they're going to wait on a full next phase reveal until D23. That's right. only a month away. Yeah. So uh, I want to know how much now is going to be f- movies versus Disney Plus. I think it's going to be a lot of TV shows, and it's not just what we consider the Disney TV shows. I think some of the Fox TV shows, like The Simpsons, is on the schedule, and it's under the Disney banner now, which mm. is so weird to think about. But I think there's going to be a lot of like Agents of Shield and Simpsons. And what do you guys know about Fuggy? His history, like, was he a comic book nerd as a kid? 
Because he really... I think so. Like, apparently he started as a producer, and they, like that's always been his role in Hollywood. Yeah. But... Why? Like, did he just fall into Marvel, or is that his dream job? No, I think that's his dream job. Yeah. I think he's he's had a, a long relationship with the characters, and he definitely knows them, he, and, and has shepherded yeah. them in the right ways. Okay. I I also think it must be a hard, really hard job. Yeah. So I oh, would, when he leaves Marvel, we'll give him a forty-five minute eulogy. <laughs> Don't worry on this podcast. For at least free. I believe it for free <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Don't you worry. Don't you worry. All right, before we get on to our next segment, I want to thank the sponsor that makes this episode possible, and that's Petronix. Um, do you ever wonder why your cat seems to get bored of its toys so fast? That's because cats are natural-born predators that want to hunt. But today's automatic toys just move around randomly. But real prey isn't random. Real prey reacts. That's why the guys at Petronix invented Mouser, a fully autonomous robotic mouse for your cat. At P- as PhD students in the electrical engineering department at the University of Illinois, they knew that Mouser had to be a real robot to actually be interesting for cats. So Mouser comes with a complete suite of sensors and onboard intelligence so they can sense and react to your cat and its environment. Did you ever think that your cat would have a robot friend before you? Well, right now, tested cat owners like you can save 20% when you, when you visit Petronix.io slash test and use the code test at checkout. Again, that's P-E-T, Petronics, P-E-T-R-O-N-I-C-S dot I-O slash test with the checkout code test to save 20% because you and your cat need more robots in your lives. All right. Well, we do have a little bit of Apple news to get started with. Well, first of all, Jimmy, did you have thoughts on Johnny Ive retiring? Nope. No? No. No. I, I, I'm excited to see what he's doing. I don't need him to design, to design an airport <laughs> to, to maintain my interest. I think that would be interesting, I suppose. But uh, no, I just I just want to see what he does and what other companies he works for. And What uh, about your favorite yeah. Apple, Johnny Ive design? From Apple, I think you guys are right with the with the iPod. Well, you you mentioned the iMac, but I think it was like iPod, the evolution of the iPod. I really I thought that was a really salient discussion about how it used to be much more iterative, and there were lots more changes, and we've reached this kind of level of I don't know design perfection that uh, is a lot more consistent. You look at your fourth gen Apple Watch, and you look at a first gen Apple Watch. They're yeah, kind of the same. Yep. Yeah, they've kind of locked in on those interaction so models. That, that actually, that made me sympathize with the decision to leave. Yeah. Uh, well, other things are leaving Apple, including the 12-inch MacBook, which th- I think is a good thing. So remember, this is the, the smallest, thinnest MacBook, the one that was just named MacBook, um, that they first unveiled before the new design of the MacBook Air. It was like the, the future of the MacBook was based on this, kind of the retina screen, those real, the butterfly keys really surfaced with this. <laughs> And Apple's getting rid of it. Good. They have too many SKUs. Too many SKUs. And, and also it was confusing because the, the tw- Air was the not the smallest one. Yeah. And the 12 and the 13, I don't think, are really that terribly different in size and scope. So, yeah. Uh, I think this is a great simplification. And really, the elimination of the MacBook Air is just the elimination of the previous MacBook. generation. No, no. They're eliminating a previous gen MacBook Air as Oh, okay. Well. The gotcha. very entry level, uh, the non-retina one. Gotcha. So now it's simplified to Mac, the new MacBook Air, which the base price for a MacBook is now $1,100, as opposed to $1,000, hmm. and, um, and the MacBook Pros. The 13 and the 15. 13 and the 15 MacBook Pros. And they all have touchscreens now. Or not touchscreens, no, but touch, touch bars. bars. Yeah, touch bars. which no touch is screens. unfortunate because the touch bar sucks. And they uh, all have the same keyboard, this butterfly keyboard, mm-hmm. although we did talk about how they have changed some of the material underneath, so they claim that's going to improve it. <laughs> and interestingly, right after the announcement of the retirement of Johnny I for the, him leaving Apple was when some of the reports came out that uh, Apple might be also now changing the design of their keyboards to get rid of their... Uh, those scissor switch keys. Mm-hmm. And the the meta conversation is that Johnny Ive was the one who pushed for the design in the interest of thinness that 
led to the design that no one really was happy with. Mm-hmm. That consumers definitely felt frustrated with, given you know the the, the failure rates and also the lack the just the lack of travel on those keys. Well, okay, but he probably also pushed for uh, decades of design that were successful. Yes, oh, you absolutely. Know, challenged the engineering team to push things further, and it was great. Totally, I do think that this, if they successfully pull off a new keyboard design, a new switch design that is doesn't need to be exactly those chiclet keys, but a return to form and something more satisfying with fewer, uh, less prone to failure, uh, that will that would be huge for, for Apple. And that might be, uh, the rumor is, later this year. Um, and then also in MacBooks, of course, everyone's kind of expecting the 15-inch MacBook to maybe be replaced by a 16-inch MacBook Pro, uh, which would be the edge-to-edge wow. display one. Uh, but that done, that's not anticipated until uh, probably next year. And my hope for that, if that if Apple does do that and replace the 15 inch MacBook Pro, I'm sure they're going to charge a lot for it. It better have um, Ice Lake processors from Intel, 10 nanometer processors. Uh, did you see this video? It's an old video actually from 2017, but it's uh, from Jeff Williams over at, um, at Apple. He's the the COO, but he was visiting Corning and did a little presentation, a speech at Corning. And this video was surfaced because uh, last week we found out that Jeff Williams is now kind of the, uh, the the person in charge now. He's the one that's that everyone reports to, that the new uh, new design heads, the new head of industrial design, head of inter- interface design, um, they report to Jeff Williams, who is now, everyone thinks, is kind of like the, the CEO in waiting, hmm. if Tim Cook ever decides to retire. Um, so... No one knows a ton about Jeff Williams. He's been there with Apple for for a very long time, for you know since before the iPhone, um, and he was at Corning doing a talk about Apple's relationship with Corning. Now Apple has been famously secretive about its suppliers for for a lot of the components that go into the devices. I remember yeah. the first couple of years of iPhone, you could not figure out who you couldn't. Like, they would never say, and even suppliers wouldn't say that they were supplying. For, for Apple, but everyone assumed that like Corning's Gorilla Glass was was what was being used in uh, in the iPhones, and this basically confirms it. And it's a funny story that he tells about why the uh, that why the iPhone has a glass display as opposed to a plastic display. Did you guys did you watch the video? No. So it turns <coughs> out. Do you remember when Steve Jobs went on stage and he announced the iPhone back in two thousand seven? Yes. That prototype. And the expectation was that the, all the iPhones that was going to come out six months later would have a plastic screen. Huh. That's what was announced. It, iPhone wait, would have whoa, whoa. A, They announced at that unveiling that it had a plastic screen? Plastic screen. They said that? It was not glass. <laughs> it was a... They then, closer to the iPhone's release six months later, they issued a press release saying, iPhone has, one, a little more battery life than we expected, uh-huh. and two... Surprise, it's going to be all glass finish. Huh, okay. Or all glass on the front. Yeah. And that's because, according to Jeff Williams, Steve Jobs, after the keynote, spent a couple more days with that prototype and then called, called up the team and said, hey, everything's working great, but I got scratches on this phone in my pocket. I don't like that. Let's make this up glass. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Williams and the operations team... In the next few months. In the next few months yeah. said, we can't do that. <laughs> and so he called, called Corning... And or Corning called them, mm-hmm. called Jeff Williams and said, hey, uh, Steve Jobs called me. Your boss called me and said, your glass sucks. Give me better glass. And they worked together to find technology glass prototypes that were on the R&D shelf at Corning and in the span of six months, get that production ready. And that R&D shelf, shelved R&D glass was Gorilla Glass. Holy cow. And that's why Gorilla Glass is everywhere. Wow. Okay. Interesting story. Yeah. I, just, I just thought it was a fascinating insight into how how fast turnaround uh, happens and also a little bit of a Jeff Williams role over at Apple. A um, little more Mac stuff, but this one's kind of uh, about iOS and Android. But Jeremy, was, was it you who put the story in? What, what's with this? Dr. Mario? Yep. Well, it's out on the iPhone, on iOS devices, I suppose. This is a... Uh, uh, Nintendo's second mobile game. Well, it's not because they had another one, right? Like the uh, is it was it like an Animal Crossing kind of thing? Uh, was that a companion app or a full game? Uh, I don't know. But I anyway, don't play the, the, the the only this is the first one I've downloaded since the Mario game. Uh, Super what is it? Super Mario Jump? Run. Run. 
And uh, yeah, it's you know it's Nintendo once again with a Mario game on the App Store. It seemed newsworthy. It's uh, you know match three. However, this one, unlike Run, is uh, free to play. But it, like Run, persistent internet connection is required. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? They, they disabled that on Run after a they while. Did. They so did. They s- did that on this at launch. Yeah, you cannot play for Doctor Mario. You cannot play Doctor Mario World offline. I'm really curious Why? what that is, especially if it's free to play. Especially for a match three game. Yeah, yeah. Nintendo and internet stuff. They don't. They don't do well with with web. No, <laughs> right. Syncing devices. Yeah. A uh, couple bits of random technology news. Uh, this thing caught my eye. Do you guys have a moment lenses? Have you guys used these lenses? These are lens attachments for for smartphones. They're very popular. These mm-hmm. giant lenses. I've had several lenses for uh, for phones, but not, yeah. not this brand, I suppose. Apparently, they're well regarded. They're kind of expensive, uh, but they're well regarded for the quality of glass and the optics. And they are really bulky, but they uh, the images that you can get from them are, are supposedly pretty good. Well, they came out with a, an anamorphic lens for for iPhone uh, last year that sold really well, and now they have announced via Kickstarter. An anamorphic lens attachment for a DJI Mavic 2 drone. Okay. And it looks, the footage, I think, looks fantastic. So obviously it, it compresses an anamorphic image onto the same sensor. You get you, wider screen. You have to be able to un- <coughs> unstretch that in your editor somehow. Or stretch it. Because uh, it would be a different you know, yes. a- aspect ratio. Yeah, you have, to, you have to process it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, it's fitting within the 16 by 9 frame. Yeah. And More I- information. I'm assuming it's light enough that it doesn't affect anything well, with the gimbal operation. And that's stuff. the cool mechanical action because lens attachments for drones are, are not an easy thing to do. And so they've, they've developed the entire housing with a counterweight that fits onto the gimbal. Oh, no kidding. And the whole thing has oh. to be light enough so that it do, you don't have to recalibrate the gimbal wow. um, for it to just work. Plus, the lens also has ND filter attachments so you can then shoot, you know, mm-hmm. at. at uh, low shutter speeds. Raised a quarter million dollars on Kickstarter so it's far. It's going to be very successful. The Mavic Mavic Pro and the Mavic Zoom are uh, very, very popular drones, and, and I can't wait to see the footage to come out. It makes me want one of those drones, actually, to film some stuff. But we have more restrictive fi- filming rules here, so uh, I don't know if we would actually be able to make the most out of it. Um, Is it $200 for the lens? Yes, yeah. $200 yeah. for the lens, and then uh, they have a, like a slim case and also ND filters that you can buy, different ND filter pack. Cool. Uh, have you guys heard about Spotify Lite or Lite versions of apps? The new trend now. I have a lot of Lite apps on, on, my, on Android. So tell on us about Android. the experience. What, what is? I mean, the initial design, like the one that I first got was Facebook because I always, I, I never liked the Facebook app. It was big. It, it hogged a lot of data. It did a lot of things they didn't need to do. And so they had a slimmed down version that promised to be, you know, much more data conscious. And then since then, there's been a, sort of a bevy of these uh, of these apps that have come out. So that's what light means. And that's it's what light means uses. is that it's smaller physical footprint. So it would be a smaller app, like 10 megabytes instead of 100 or whatever. Um, and that it, it uses less data, has less features associated to it. What I really like about this Spotify Lite app that came out is it allows you to control data usage, which, dip, you know, if you're on certain plans, being able to control how much data that Spotify is consuming mm-hmm. is, is a really nice feature. And to get a notification yeah, when and you reach a certain threshold. Some phones allow you to do that just natively on the phone, but I think it's much better to have that just integrated. Does it do app. that by adjusting the sound quality or by capping the bandwidth? It's capping the bandwidth. Got it. Mm. Um, that's very cool. Yeah, it's something that we would never really see on on the App Store. Also, yeah. In the apps, yeah. Also, I think this has got to be the trend to just less bloated apps. That I mean, we don't need full feature sets in Do the you apps think so? compared to. I don't know. Like my phone, it has two hundred and fifty six gigabytes. It's not about space. It's about like the features that I actually need in the app compared to what the desktop version can do. Because I'm just not using all of that functionality that's in place. Well, I mean, you see Facebook doing something like splitting off Messenger from the f- primary Facebook application, right? And mm-hmm. they haven't really combined Instagram with Facebook. The things they own, they, they still hold in separate discrete. And I can imagine doing that for, like, video functions within some of those apps, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
let's go through the next couple things relatively quickly because I want to talk about some VR and Spider Man. But um, Uber, Uber Uber's launching a comfort tier. Yeah, this is so this so is garbage. So oh my weird. goodness, I mean, awful. <laughs> this is the Spirit Airlines meets Uber well, of like pay for every little okay. feature. Look, the, That's not what it like. <laughs> wait, I am not done. I am so mad about this <laughs> because it's also pay so the driver doesn't talk to you. That's it. What? No, no, no. Uh, no, you pay for the amount of conversation you want. So I assume you can request additional talking. <laughs> what is wrong with our culture? Please don't talk to me. Here's some money. Yeah. So in addition to the Uber X and the Uber, like uh, Uber Black, um, you also have now Uber Comfort, which is looks like it's more expensive, but you get it's cars with more leg room. So they're nickel and diming you based on the type of car. In additional economy plus. Yep. Right. And then also for level of interaction. Yes. See, if they had called this like Uber introvert or Uber I'm an anxious person, <laughs> I'd actually kind of understand it but a little more. they call it comfort. They call it comfort because they're dickheads. This Uber be a jerk mode. I'm busy. Conference you know, call This mode. is a sign of the future. Like you're going to be able to choose your friends and pay your friends for the amount of chattiness you want from them. What if, what if it's the, the Uber like isolation chamber mode where cars have like plexiglass now yeah. installed between, then it becomes a freaking taxi. Can you imagine <laughs> having a podcast where you record everyone's audio on separate channels and you pay extra to mute the person you don't like on the show? Wow. What is that? Why did you think of that? That's amazing because Patreon they're... option. <laughs> yeah. <they're... laughs> Holy smokes. Technology's already there. It might be reflected. Oh, you mean some... as a listener? Yeah, as a I listener. I thought you guys would mute me. No. Okay. No, no, no. As a listener, I want to pay for the premium feed where, I'm sorry, Kishore's mic is muted the whole time. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's just, it, the weird thing is, you can ask drivers if, if they would mind not talking right now because you have some things to think about. You can do that mm -hmm. for the low, low price of standard Uber. For the low, low price of being a normal, decent person <laughs> right. and interacting with the person giving you a ride. Yes. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure I've ever had a problem with leg room in any car, but I'm only like 5'9". Just awful. Yeah it's, yeah, it's definitely weird. Yeah, uh, On the Tesla side, we're not going to jump into the, the shower this week, but two bits of Tesla news. One, actually, I, I'll go three bits. Um, Elon Musk responded on Twitter about two, a couple things. One, um, people asked if there's going to be a, a refresh on the Model S and X, and he said, we don't do refreshes, so no refresh. The speculation was that the Model S and X was due for an interior update where the interface would get... Um, parity with the Model 3 it would be that one screen oh. interface. You and mean and rotated? And, or maybe not. Maybe hmm. still be landscape as opposed to portrait. I don't know how that would work. That would be a, a I would call that a refresh if they designed that. But I think um, Elon's quote was that they don't do refreshes. There are continuous improvements happening all the time, but they're a non traditional car company. So it's not like you're buying your new Toyota every year where you have a 2017, 2018, 2019 model. Yeah. It is just whatever Model S. And I think he has to say that because he doesn't want people to wait, right? A lot of people traditionally buy BMWs or Mercedes Benz, they wait for the the next year model because yeah. that's going to be the best model for the you know, foreseeable future for this design ID. And it's not like this, Tesla hasn't done refreshes. Physical like ID refreshes on their cars. They had the whole front bumper of the Model S change. Yep. Um, the Model X. The the uh, they had the uh, the uh, was a spoiler was previously movable and now it's a, a firm stick a stuck spoiler. And hardware has changed. They just and, came out with the hardware level three, which has again full autopilot capability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have that? Or, I don't have that. So you bought just before that came out. That's right. You didn't know a refresh was right around the corner. Nope. Nope. But if you listen to Elon, it's not an actual refresh. And of course. So he's just saying, buy the cars now. Don't wait for the next thing, um, because some things might be upgradable. Although, of course, a design interior would not be upgradable if they actually change the interior. Design. Did you happen to see his Twitter discussion with one of his followers about the price of Tesla's going up? But no, once full autopilot is released, no, because he thinks, and probably rightly so, if if everything he has says will come to fruition, that the uh, the return on a self-driving car is much greater than 
the depreciation that you see from your standard automobile. Okay. Uh, so if you can send your car out while you're at home and not using it to be an Uber to, uh, your car I mean, for that's, people. I mean, that's what he's promised for so long. I don't think that's going to happen and for, for a foreseeable future. Earn you an income. Right. But he's saying, you know, it will. This is, cl- this is not like a pipe dream for him. This is on the roadmap. Okay. Uh, once that happens, the, you know, the, the return on, on that purchase yeah. will, be, will actually be great compared to nothing on a standard car. And they want that price to be reflected in the initial selling price. And so he feels that if they don't raise the price, then scalpers, essentially, people who, who want to use this as a business will buy up all the Teslas and resell them at a premium or just use them as their own you know, Uber service. Why so can't you just unlock or... So they will up the price. And so his, his, his another incentive to buy now is wow. that it, buy now be, that's while some, it's still consumer prices. That's some billionaire logic right there. <laughs> All right. And wow. Well, you did. You're in, you're in early. Hey, so you didn't get the full autopilot package. I didn't package. get the full autopilot package. Do I don't think, have the hardware 2.0. Do you think you'll upgrade to the... It's 3. Or hardware do, you, 3.0. do you think you'll upgrade eventually? Uh, I'm going to wait to see how the full autopilot performs. I'm happy with the current level of autopilot that yeah. I have, and I don't live in a place like in the suburbs where a full autopilot might perform better. So I have no reason to do it. But the chip upgrade, there is a timeline, and he says that uh, hardware 3.0, um, the full self-driving chip, by the end of this year, people will, if, if you've paid for the full autopilot, will be able to bring their cars in to get that processor upgrade, that board upgrade. Yeah. Um, someone also asked him, could they, uh, when full autopilot is finally turned on, could you put a uh, I'm feeling lucky mode in destination? What? <laughs> and he said, done. And they said, next feature update. It, in fact, you could have it now. Like, I'm feeling lucky. Yeah. And it would point you to a place where other Tesla drivers have gone, like interesting destinations. Okay, of that's interesting use of metrics. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They know where people are going. But Apple Maps, Google Maps could add that too. But you're in the car. You could, be, the 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 it tying to a full autopilot experience. For mm-hmm. I'm feeling lucky. For I have this much range. I want to go somewhere what? with a 20 minute drive. It's, I'm feeling lucky. Take me somewhere interesting. I car. I disagree that until you have full autopilot, that that is not that different from a standard from Google Maps implementing the same feature. You think it is that different? You're still driving out of your garage through yeah. the city onto the highway, and the whole time you're driving, you have your hand on that wheel and you're paying attention. Yeah. Are you guys having a fever dream over there? Who would use that <laughs> I feature? Know. I don't know. <laughs> what are you talking about? I think it's... Uh, I, Take I, me somewhere random, car. Hey, I, you know, rainy day, man. I would just what? sit there pressing I'm feeling lucky just repeatedly. Oh, I think... It's like, show me the in- different places. Really? It's only interesting if you don't know where you're going. Like, you, <laughs> Oh, you, you don't want to see the path. <laughs> no. Okay, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> No. This is the no. most insane thing I've ever My heard car on is this taking mic. me into a dark alley. <laughs> My car is going to kill me. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm curious how this will be implemented. But he, in, in the Twitter exchange, he's like, done. It's in the, it'll be in the next future update. It's a clever idea. Yeah. That's the speed at which they move. Um, two, two, two. Uh, this, you see this video? Engadget shared a video um, about uh, using AI to enhance slow motion video. Uh, this is from... I did not get why this was interesting. So this is uh, from... Um, what, what is this institution? Uh, Zurich, right? Mm-hmm. We have high frame rate cameras that can do better than this. No, did you see... This is interpolation. Yeah, I get it. But what's the point if we have cameras that can do it? Well, th- the point is that handheld cameras, mm-hmm. if you if you shot a video, an With, old video, at 30 FPS, mm-hmm. you can now watch it slow down and using AI, yeah. you'll, you'll be able to turn that motion blur into something. It doesn't just blend frames. It actually looks at the objects and it moves them through space. It creates some you know, rotational movement. Yeah. It, it looks at how what things are actually happening. They have like water balloons exploding, you know, um, and it's it's a neat implementation, I, guess, I think, uh, of some deep learning. I guess, I guess I could see it if it was in a phone, you know, because professionally, this is unnecessary. If you're doing slow motion, you can get whatever frame yes. you want practically. Yeah. But if you were like editing a video and you wanted to create some slow motion effect yeah and you didn't film it at 240 fps or you did and you want to even slow down even further Mm -hmm. like you would be able to and the it really depends on what event is happening not many things happen at that speed explosions are really the thing that you're capturing that you need that high frame rate uh 
or, or particle effects, right? Like some type of fluid movement or some type of debris flying. Like then, and, and in that scenario, they can build the system to have enough data to make it look pretty believable. Yeah. I thought it was the, the demos they had were pretty impressive. Well, slow mo is always fun. Yeah, absolutely. It's a microscope for time. Um, this guy. That's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, VidCon is this weekend. We can't, it, we can't forget to talk about Gary. I don't see him on this oh, list. Okay. We'll, we'll do it at the end of tech. All right, fine. Yeah, uh, there's no elegant way to... Yeah, VidCon is this weekend. Quickly, YouTube Institute new policies. If you're a YouTuber, uh, there are new policies where if people are filing claims against you, manual claims, you have to institute now timestamps. So a lot of people get manual claims or recklessly filed. Um, and then they have now... They're going to put new tools for YouTubers to replace the infringing parts of their video, whether it's music with um, other music or they can actually chop out part of the video. It's new editing tools. It's, it's useful. So they're not just immediately demonetized exactly. or taken down. Yeah. That sounds right. great. That's the first time I've said that about YouTube in a while. <laughs> yeah. I read this really interesting story on uh, on Torrent Freak. Now, it's not a, about... It, the site isn't there for let you pirate videos, but it is about pirating. And people in the pirating community, like the people in pirating content since there was digital media, right? From DVDs, CDs, to obviously now digital files. And the whole like decrypting Blu-rays, I, I have a fairly good understanding of that. Mm-hmm. But I've always been curious what it took to take these source files from a place like Netflix or Amazon. Because those files do get out mm-hmm. into the wild. And it's not just like some sort of capture card situation? I yeah, think I... there is a scenario where a capture card bypasses the DRM that's you know between the display and the yeah. the output that lets you capture and that's a version of pirating but they're apparently according to this article and they talk to one of these pirates who works in the pirating scene there are very specialized coded tools that are created within the scene for decrypting these streams and more interestingly these tools are so valuable that the the people within those groups have to have special hardware. They are tied to their computers, the hardware IDs, to use these decrypting tools. What? Yeah. What are you talking about? Why are they valuable, first of all? I don't, I think of piracy as being something where they steal something and give it away on BitTorrent or what not. That, 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 that is, that's, that's a really interesting point. I mean, why is it valuable? Because the value comes from the people who, want, who pirate, who want to be notarized. The notoriety. So that's it. Of, of being the people who pirated, to have their name. Your zero day. And you are, you are the group that mm-hmm. liberated the media yeah. into the world to a point where the tools and versions of the tools are sold on in the dark web. There must be a bigger industry. Like, there must be actual... I mean, obviously, these discs are often sold on street corners in every country. Right, right, there right. There must be an industry there that's actually making money. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. Like, that's a good point. Like, people stealing these streams... I guess why wouldn't they just download? Like, it, why wouldn't they just take yeah. the stuff that was already pirated, and then if they're going to sell it as physical media or sell it as something overseas? Yeah. I'm sure there's a quality play here because stuff isn't always consistent. I don't know, but it's, it's different fascinating. languages, like, it, different dubs, all of that. Kind there's of stuff. the whole politics of this pirating scene, um, and they they got access to someone who worked there, and honestly, and worked where or worked in the, within the scene. Oh, in the <laughs> worked in the scene, yeah, and and works with that these was, groups. That was a little narky right there, Jeremy. You're like, where, 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 where? 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 <laughs> I need an address. <laughs> no, I thought because my question was going to be, do they they have inside info? Well, yeah, do they have any inside help in right. de- in decrypting these files or right. getting access to the streams? And that's what when you said someone who worked there, right. I thought you meant at Netflix. And it sounds like the. Uh, even the big companies, the big media companies, they work with third parties to create the encryption algorithms. And one of the takeaways from the story is a lot of these scene pirates are worried because they know there is a new form of encryption or an update to the encryption coming mm-hmm. that one will invalidate their decryption tools, uh, which they don't know if they can actually overcome. Yeah. Which, you know, that's that's the, always the battle. As long as there will be DRM, there will be people trying to create ways around it or trying to hack it. Dog chasing the tail. Uh, you bought a Raspberry Pi 4 a couple I weeks ago? I did. And Are you ever thinking about returning it or no, canceling your order? No, it's a collector's item. Oh, apparently, the uh, it's, this is not a big deal, and I would have never noticed this. But apparently, uh, despite 
a, a massive you know testing of with uh, internally and, and externally they they missed a problem with the USB jack and apparently it, there's a spec for USB adherence and you have to include on two of the pins they, they need to be connected to resistors and rather than using individual resistors for each of these pins they used a single resistor and apparently that means that if you connect the Raspberry Pi to the right kind of charger and use the right kind of cable the charger will think that it's an audio device and it won't charge or de deliver power to the Raspberry Pi this is not something I would have encountered but apparently there's some people who have and the solution is to use a different cable it's very cheap and inexpensive not a real big problem but it's an issue, and they will be fixing it, uh, they think, within a couple months. There'll be a design rev, and everyone will be able to deliver power to their Raspberry Pi. So that would be everyone pre-ordering one now going forward would get this No, fix? no. Well, obviously now they're flooded the market with these ones that have the issue. But those, those sold out so quickly. You know what else has the issue? What else? The Switch. Yeah. Nintendo Switch? Yes. Oh. So it doesn't charge on <coughs> similar kinds of you know cables. So it's not, I think it's, I've noticed that. Have you? Yeah, I think I've had cables where the switch won't charge. Oh, well, there you go. I always thought it was a cables problem. So, it's, yeah, it, Raspberry Pi sells their own charger. That happens to work just fine. Of course. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's just an interesting <coughs> little, little... Just another reason to get the switch light, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last bit of tech. Let's talk about Gary. Our friend Gary Witta. Yeah, dude. Former host of this podcast. Yeah, my old former boss at PC Gamer Magazine. He did a stream... Last night, that I want to say was in was years in the making, because <laughs> honestly, certainly weeks. He, <laughs> no, no, he ten years. How long ago did the book of Eli come out? It was like oh nine, yeah. So ten years ago, um, and he it was his first major <laughs> motion picture that he wrote, turned into script. It was optioned and starred Denzel Washington, and huge huge thing for Gary. And it's the one of the films I think of the three that major motion pictures that he's written uh, that um uh what was the the will smith movie after earth after earth and um and star wars story rogue one uh that the book of Eli is the one that he seems to be most proud of because yeah. what ended up on the screen so much reflected what he put down on the page yeah and except it wasn't a white a british white dude and it never and it never had a commentary track so really it, yeah so now this month it appeared on netflix and he took advantage of that opportunity to finally record a commentary track and we had been talking about this for years Years ago, I, he brought it up, and I, was, and I was urging him to do it. I said, I'll bring audio equipment to your house. We'll record this. Let's make this happen. And he never wanted to. And then I think kind of brilliantly, he found a way to do it that's m so much more compelling than your standard commentary track. He hopped on Twitch. He had everybody who was in the room hit play at the same time. And he delivered what I think was a fantastic commentary to the movie. I think it legit was the best commentary I've ever seen. Yeah? Because of how much depth of information, behind the scenes content, you got to see the script that he originally wrote versus he did, like scroll the script page by page, did he? He yeah. tried he tried to keep up with uh. it. He tried he didn't always. Th if we were to do this again, I would suggest having somebody whose job it was to do that. Yeah, and Gary said so himself. But it was amazing. You'd see like very subtle differences between the film and what was in the original script and he would address it uh, like he, he it was really um it, it made the movie better uh because oh, yeah. he explained choices they had made uh added a lot of uh, uh of just sort of color to the uh, entire experience uh and then he spent like an additional two hours after doing the commentary just taking questions from people wow yeah, I felt like I was at an event. Honestly, I went to bed and I was I felt like I just got back from a concert. Like I <laughs> I really felt this is a totally different experience than your standard commentary track. Before having kids, I used to watch a lot of movies with director's commentary and I would buy the discs just for that and that was how I one thing I, I enjoyed doing and it, I never felt like I was part of an event. Well, like, it, was, it was a live it was live. Exactly. I mean, you you had to watch at that moment and be a part of the 3,500 people in That's the chat. Right. That's right. Yeah, he got raided, at, unfortunately, after the movie ended. Oh. However, if they had joined mid-movie, they wouldn't have known what to do or what was happening. So this actually worked out quite well, he, I think. He didn't get raided. He hit the front page of Twitch. You're exactly right. And so, you know, there's thousands of people there at any given moment that started watching him immediately. What, uh, what I thought was sort of fascinating about it is normally when you watch a DVD commentary, they are 
optimizing the commentary so that you can watch the movie, like listen to the movie and pay attention. Gary was like, no, I'm going to talk through pretty much the entire movie. <laughs> yeah. Like he barely took any breaks and he would acknowledge things. And I think that's why it was better because I've always been bothered by commentaries that just pause for long stretches. Yeah. And I mean, we've, we've had that problem. It's tough when you, when we do like a, an authorized commentary, we want to watch the movie ourselves. And so we can't talk yeah. the whole time. And we obviously weren't involved in those productions, so we wouldn't have as much to say. And he, it's, it, it lived in his head for so long. Right, yeah. And he, he ignored the Twitch uh, chat for the duration of the movie, which I think was the right thing to do. And he just focused on the movie, um, and he had friends and, uh, and his wife moderate and, every, mm-hmm. and help out while the movie was going on and explained that he wasn't paying attention. And he did a great job. I, I mean, for somebody who pretends to be not very technical he has become a professional twitch streamer i mean he's done he, a has job. Bu- he has bubbles yeah <laughs> he does right the best 25 dollars you can buy yeah to help your twitch stream well done guys yeah i think he's going to upload or um uh, the archive of that stream to his youtube channel to the youtube channel yeah so we can watch that but you will obviously won't get the live experience yeah, i mean you there's a, qu- a timer on the screen yeah so you can actually start the movie but he's saying, like, you can't contribute to chat. Yes. And yeah. that, that's absolutely true. But uh, as I said, and well, as Kishor said, it is one of the great commentary tracks. And he did a wonderful job. There's a point at the end where he gets a little emotional, which caused me to get a little emotional. Wow. It was great. Well worth your time. I hope he does it for, I know it'll be complicated to do this for Rogue One, um, given how many other writers and just, it, you know, being a Star Wars property. But I, I think he should do this for more movies that he's worked on, more but he's talking series. about doing it with other movies too, right? Yeah. Um, he's, you know, he released photos or concept art of the last Starfighter remake that he's working on with the original screenwriter of that film. He's talked about doing this same com- kind of commentary style for the original last Starfighter with him. So that would be, I mean, that's, I think it's a great idea. I think this could be a whole new Twitch genre. Moment of science. Uh, two quick stories before we get to the big ones. Uh, do you remember? Is, I think it was, must have been almost ten years ago now. There is this famous dancing cockatoo. It was this bird that would dance to the Backstreet Boys oh, everybody wait. song on the beat. Yes, and it would like <laughs> raise its like talons up and down and like bob its head. Yeah, and it, it would do it on the beat, and it became famous. It like went on Letterman. It like it went all these places. Well, scientists always wanted to study that cockatoo because the idea was that is it doing it just because of mimicking behavior? Is it doing it for rewards? And in a paper that came out just a couple weeks ago uh, that analyzed this bird over many years, uh, it has demonstrated two things that are just shocking. So one, this bird is not dancing for rewards. Whoa. It is free dance. It is dancing because it apparently likes dancing. (laughs) And even crazier than that, it is inventing dance moves. (laughs) It is not just doing the same moves. It had 14 distinct dance moves. Copyright that. There are videos in that link that's in the show notes that you can see. It has like a bob down and bring up, a bob down and bring up. It has like talon moves. It has neck moves. This thing has more dance moves than I do. And I, it's just <laughs> shocking that basically here is a creature uh, um, that we don't associate to that behavior that just likes dancing. And it is obviously not hearing music in the same way we do. Wait a minute now. But it is interpreting a beat and making movements to it. Yeah, that's important to me. Like, is it doing it on the beat? Like, does it have, does it? For move, the most part. Move I mean, to the it's tempo. A, it is a bird. So it's, you know. Anatomical mechanics are different, it's but a yes, bird that you're telling me invents dance moves, and we're talking about in a moment of science. Yes, it is pretty close to the beat, so it is dance. You can watch videos of it dancing to three songs, and all these songs are not overdubbed, like they are the songs that the bird is. It hearing? is playing. You can hear two versions, uh-huh. so it also squeals while it's dancing. So if you re- listen to the raw video of the music playing, yeah, it's really irritating because this bird is going. Aah! <laughs> as it's dancing um it's got but, soul but you can also listen to a dub version that's more okay. watchable yeah um but it danced to uh another one bites the dust uh-huh uh everybody from the backstreet boys and um oh 
There's, oh, girls just want to have fun by Cindy Lauper. So does it? So it can't. It does. <laughs> are you saying those are the three songs it can dance to? Those are the three songs that, they have video okay. of it demonstrating fourteen distinct dances. Yes, I want to study this bird. This is great. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. Birds. Well, at least this bird has some dance moves. Has there ever been studies about do animals have a sense of rhythm up until now? Uh, I'd have to look, but there's definitely uh, yes. According to the vines, so. yes. <laughs> yes, there's something in primates about this, but I have to. It's like very faintly in my memory. I have okay. to look it up. All right. Uh, just now, just minutes before this, actually two hours ago, Virgin launched uh, the Virgin Orbit, which is their sort of beefed up 747 looking plane. And what they're doing from this plane is they're uh, off the side, next off the wing, next to one of the engines. They drop. What appears to be like a missile, but really it's a low Earth satellite launcher. So it drops off the side of the plane once it's reached this high orbit. And then the 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 satellite launcher, which literally looks like a missile, fires up and, and launches into space. It's a way they say is more cost efficient to deliver uh, satellites to space Hmm. uh, because you're using plane infrastructure. Um, and uh, the system of where you're using that plane infrastructure to take you, you know, 40, 30, 40 percent of the way there and then launching a rocket from that distance is more efficient. I don't actually know about the economics of that, uh, but there's exceptional video from the Virgin Orbit thread of it launching this. Um, and the they did the drop of the of the satellite launcher maybe 20 minutes ago. And you can see video of it falling off the wing. Wait, wait, and so it the, falls off the wing and then the and then, engine inside the rocket kicks on and shoots out to it. So it me. needs to fall in a predictable way. Mm-hmm. And they said at this point, all we know is that the fall was recorded exactly as cleanly as they uh, expected. And launches the satellite. Satellite yeah. stays in And orbit. right now, they're not doing the satellite launch. Like, it's not launching satellites into space oh, on this. Test. This is a test flight. But this satellite launcher will, will parachute back to Earth? Uh, I don't know about how it it lands. Okay. All right. But yes. Okay. Wow. Super interesting. All right. Let's get to the big story. We are a few days away Hmm. from the Apollo 11 50th anniversary. And this could not. I mean, I get it. Everywhere you look, there's some book, there's some documentary, there's some film. Lego set. Yeah. There's Lego (laughs) set. There's like there seems to be more astronauts than there were astronauts in a lifetime just appearing everywhere. (laughs) I get it. I get it. And just lean into it. It's going, and I cannot make a bigger push for what's going to happen on the National Mall. They announced this two days ago. Testa is going to be there. Joey and Adam are going to be there. They are projection mapping on the Washington Monument, the Saturn V, and they have side screens. It's like it was made for this. Next to the monument that are going to display the crowd. There's one giant screen that is just the countdown clock. And on, uh, you know, July 19th, they're going to projection map the launch of the Saturn V rocket um, on the side of the Washington Monument. Can, like, you, can you imagine being I cannot believe this. in the boardroom when they're brainstorming ideas and someone pitches this? I, I just yeah, imagine. I can because it, it was like it's literally the 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 gif of Fry being like, take my money. Like, exactly. That's what I would have done <laughs> exactly. in that moment. I'd be like, like, of course we're doing that. That's amazing. Uh, I, I think what's going to happen there is special. Norm, do you want to speak to what t- uh, Adam and Tessa is doing there? I don't know if we... I mean, like, Adam's roughly. being involved with the uh, Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's exact activities. So everything they're doing from the projection mapping on uh, Washington Monument to stuff with the unveiling of Neil Armstrong's suit, uh, you can expect Adam to be involved with some of that. And we'll have a video of most of that stuff. So they have a packed week of activities. Um, you know, they have... Uh, star set a line of guests there and um it's it's gonna be very exciting if you don't follow jen schachter on the socials you should follow her she's posting all the information on the project egress um project where they're reconstructing a apollo 11 hatch um with 40 different makers yes, from across the country thursday and you can see jen has like released like drawings and um you know some behind the scenes videos like all the builders are are doing that uh, and then you said Thursday they're doing the actual reconstruction there? Yes, Thursday 18th, and with more details, location stuff to be announced. 
on Tested, you can watch the interview that Ariel and Norm did with Poppy Northcutt, who is the first female engineer in Mission Control. And she is a delight. She is probably the best follow on Twitter. <laughs> She's really sassy and fun. Uh, and she was worked on um, some of the uh, uh, calculations on a return trajectory. For Apollo 13. For Apollo 13. And, and she was, you know, in control for Apollo 11. Uh, she was just. Really? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a reconstruction of the Apollo 11 uh, control room in, uh, in Houston. Uh, and there's great video of Gene Krantz, who is the Ed Harris character, um, revisiting that, that. That just made me tear up and cry. The Apollo 11 documentary that Norm and I talked to the director of uh, is airing on CNN. And uh, a shortened version of it is playing in museums. I, I can keep going on and on and on. Just lean into it. It is <laughs> amazing. Like, and this is kind of it on some level. Like, do, I don't, we don't make it to the 75th anniversary with all these people alive. Yeah. Frankly. yeah. And so, uh, this is the, this is the chance to see it. This is, uh, the thing that I wish I was alive for, for when it happened, because we'll ne- I, like, I can't imagine a moment in humanity's history like this, where everyone from around the world was unified by one, one thing. So, uh, go for it. Send us pictures, tweet at us, um, yeah, tell us. There's incredible content of, from Smarter Every Day. It's okay to be smart where they see like the moon rock collections behind at NASA. This is a great time to be a space nerd. It, you know why we go to the moon, right? Not because it's easy. But because it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a simulator for the Apollo 11? Either the, the launch or, or mission control? Uh, I wonder I, if there's any like software that you know, is on GitHub that people can install oh. on their PCs, network together a bunch of computers, and re, you know, be a smaller version of Mission Control, and know. do the things you have to do. I think that would be fun. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. Uh, so you weren't here last week, Jeremy, but we talked about the Valve Index launch. Yeah. And some of the interesting just bits of info that were put out at the Valve party mm-hmm. uh, for that launch. But the thing they did not talk about the party that they've since kind of acknowledged through customer support f- messages is this thumbstick mm-hmm. issue. I've, I've noticed some people are taking their sticks apart in order to try to fix it. I don't know what they can do. Yeah, well... Apparently, if you push the stick to the extremity... You it, cannot it, depress it. It's no longer a... Yeah, it's a button, and you can't depress it. Th- however, I mean, how many games call for that? Not many. I was trying to think about this. Well, regardless, I think that, I mean, there is an expectation some people have on, on certain games to at least depress it and then move, right? Is that right? Um, and I think that their explanation is that this, it was by design. That it was designed so... Really? It was, I mean, they, did, they designed the functionality so that you're only supposed to depress it the, for actions in the center. And they've, their yep. workaround is that you're going to get... You can turn on like haptic feedback if you want some type of feedback to register a click at the extremities, at the left and right extremities. The problem is that the inconsistency. Some units do click. Oh, no kidding. And some do <gasps> not. You're kidding. So yeah. what causes the inconsistency? It's, I think it's like a, a membrane issue underneath. It's a okay. mechanical sign. Oh. So people are taking them apart and presumably it can be fixed. Have you tried to take yours apart? I don't want to take mine apart. Mine, on one one of the sticks, does not click. And one, it does click on one side, the left side. I think this is such a non-issue, though. I mean, I, we obviously never noticed this when we were playtesting it. And, and I, it really depends on what, what games you're playing. Yes, that but I can't think of it. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any that would cause this problem. But clearly people have encountered it. Well, think about it. On the on the touch controller, you can click yep. all the way. Yeah, but how, how am I, I'm not doing that. It's uncomfortable to push and click. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly what are the games. I'm, yeah. But some people do see it as a hardware issue. And I think the recommendation, I, I, it sounds like they're not going to be arming and replacing these. Like This is just how it is. These are the knuckles. These are the knuckles. Okay. Um, moving on, while you were gone last week, I also got to do an interesting demo with a Haptex. Okay. And uh, there'll be a video about this later this week. But this is the haptic 
glove controller or H- uh, H-A-P-T-X. 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 It's been around for a little while. I think they, I don't know if they did a crowdfunding campaign, but the ver- current version of their gloves um, they've had for over a year now. And it is super interesting. You're going to have to watch the video to see exactly some of the, how it works. But these gloves fit over your entire hand and almost arm. But, uh, and the glove is then connected. It's one hand only, the right hand. And the glove is connected to a box. Mm-hmm. Actually, no, it's, it's both hands. I had both hands. Skip that. Skip that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, th- I'm, I'm thinking of something else. Uh, it's connected to this box that uh, basically runs pneumatics, runs air. And the box has like 144 valves That's interesting. inside it. And it pushes air very quickly through these, uh, these cords into the gloves. Mm-hmm. And uh, on each of your fingers and on your palm are these panels that have these, uh, these small little bubbles, essentially, these little balloons yeah. that inflate. And they can get rigid, and they can displace like a, a millimeter or two, and they give you the sensation of, of touch. Well, okay, but do they stop your fingers from moving? No. So we talked at length in, in the interview about, the di- about haptics in general and the difference between force feedback and, and touch sensation. Okay. And the force feedback aspect, if you look at the gloves, there are these like ribbons behind the fingers, and they have a braking system. So they, you yes. get force feedback by breaking, by stopping your hand from pushing, f- or the fingers from pushing forward, your tendon movement, essentially. Uh-huh. You can't stop your arm from pushing forward, but stopping your fingers from giving it a little bit of resistance um, gives enough of a sensation so you feel like you can, you're touching like a brick wall or something. One of the things I wonder about is pneumatics is much slower than the video processing. So did you experience any latency? Now, interestingly, I did not notice the latency, even though the latency is there. And from their research, haptics latency is much less. Um, the threshold for feeling la- uh, feeling haptics, you can have much more latency than for any of the other senses, for yeah. audio and for for video, uh, where I think it's like an order of like a hundred milliseconds of latency is still fine. They didn't tell me exactly how how slow or how fast this was, uh, but the latency wasn't a problem. Uh, but it was really, really peculiar sensation um, because it's, uh, I don't know if you can find online, but there are close-ups of these pads and we'll video of these pads. But basically, they have what they call these little pixels, haptic pixels. The pads at the fingertips? At the fingertips. Uh-huh. And they're piping air into these pads and the bubbles are inflating you know, at, at a pretty high frequency uh-huh. and getting rigid and getting soft and changing constantly as the information is being sent from your interaction, your motion tracking, to to, to their model. Okay. Uh, one of the demos I did was uh, they had a virtual um, uh, car, and I was inside like the the seat of a car. They've modeled. They I think they pulled CAD from one of their partners, and they had like the steering wheel. They had buttons, and they modeled it so every button in the car was interactive. Okay. And. I could push buttons. I could pull switches. I can even pull down like the uh, the uh, um, the the sunshade. What headset were you using? Uh, it's a Vive. A Vive Pro. Uh, I think yeah, it's a Vive Pro. And so, how were the hands tracked? The hands were tracked with one. They had a Vive puck mm. on the hands. Okay. But they also have their own sensing system um, with a magnetic field for the individual movement of your fingers because your hands have what like a twenty five points of articulation. So you could see something. your hand and your finger approach the buttons. Yes. Okay. So they had finger tracking. Yeah. Um, my fingers would approach the buttons and I would be able to depress the button and then feel a little bit of pressure. Yeah. And that was that was convincing. That was fun. But the most interesting thing was holding the steering wheel. Yeah. So there's no actual physical steering wheel. I put my hands out. I put my hands on the steering wheel. And it's a weird sensation because the steering wheel is a solid object. I've noticed right? that. And then to simulate that, they're pressing all these little pixels across not only your fingertips, but also your palm. So it feels like I'm gripping pixels. the steering wheel. I'm calling them pixels because uh, there's like a How? density to them, but okay. they're not that small. They're like, you know, a millimeter or like a, a half centimeter by in, I would say, 
but five millimeter in diameter okay. is my guess. So, but there's one on each fingertip. No, no, no. There's an array of them. There's is like really. There's like a dozen oh. of them on, on each fingertip. Oh. Huh. And there are studies, and I'm not getting the numbers exactly right, but to their point, it doesn't need to be higher resolution than that. Yeah. Because okay, I buy that. People, they, you know, you, you can test. You can put like two two little, um, you know. Yeah, pencil yeah, yeah. tips of your fingers uh-huh. and move them close together and you'll feel like they're touching even though they're not touching, mm-hmm. right? Like, even though you have a high sen- high density of um, of nerve endings in your fingers, um, you can, f- you, you don't, like, you can't tell the difference between two tips that are a millimeter apart and two millimeters apart. Like, they'll feel almost the same to you. Yeah. But the interesting thing with the steering wheel was that I could then drive almost by muscle memory. I could, like, close my eyes or turn my head away and move the steering wheel and feel like that shape was there and do like a turn on the steering wheel using my palm and feel like I was getting that, that, that I was, I was actually turning the wheel. All right. This is super freaky. Well, how did you not feel like your hand went straight through the wheel? Well, I was gripping my hand like as if I was gripping the air. Yeah. Right. And I was holding it up in the air Hmm. and I was feeling just the, the pressure of those little, these little pixels against my fingers and closing my eyes. And as I was turning, I, I knew exactly, like, when you when you move your hand across the steering wheel, you're, like, rubbing against a surface, essentially, mm-hmm. right? And that little, that friction, like, holding my hand tighter and moving that, moving around the steering wheel as if I was, like, doing a big turn, Yeah, that felt like I was actually moving something. I, I wouldn't be surprised if if there's video of you that you are floating oh, yeah, in and probably. out of, of, yeah, of yeah. space. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because we can't, I mean, your eyes are essentially closed. Yeah. So that, I mean, you're, for your proprioception, you just need the force feedback of it existing. And obviously, it ergonomically, matter. it's not as comfortable as actually resting your hands on mm-hmm. a physical steering wheel object. But for the purposes of precision turning, I felt like I was doing some pretty good turns. So uh, two practical questions, yeah. uh, or three. So... Uh, pneumatics are usually loud. Could you hear it? Could not hear it. It was really quiet. So even the air air has to escape from the from the little balloons on your finger. You couldn't feel like the air escaping from no. out there because there has to be some sort of release. It was all going through their valves and and their channels. Oh. And then was the cord? Um, the cord was kind of bulky. Yeah. Did that yeah. bother you? I mean, I mean, I'm it, sure it would bother me reflect. if I was using this as a home. Like, this is not a, a home device. They are very clear. They, they said this over and over again. This is an enterprise device. They have plans to, they want to get this in the LBEs. They want to get this into a form factor that makes sense down the line, you know, a couple of years down the line. But they're about experimenting with the technology right now. I think. Um, but it wasn't so heavy or so bulky that it was no, unusable that, that was a, for a period of time. No. I would love to use this. I just, I, I'm skeptical that touching any kind of solid object it feels like a solid object like we're at the point where that actually is convincing what, so what would make sense to me is more like a dr strange kind of thing or any yeah. kind of magic element or lifting by telekinesis and feeling weight that way and it did not feel like a solid like a continuous object to me mm-hmm. that was one thing there was like i was holding like a fly swatter and i was like grabbing the the center piece and it still felt like i could tell that it was maybe the, the little the little pockets of air were, were moving. Uh, a lot of the demos they did were like raindrops, and the raindrops felt really good because yeah. the raindrops are little discrete little points. They had a spider walking on my, on my palm, and that was that was great. Freaky. Because it felt like a little spider, like yeah. tiny points. Yeah. But anytime I like push it against a, like a flat, right. big plane, it didn't feel like a solid plane. Right. So like a game like Shadow Point, this would be awesome because like holding a ball and moving it around we are doing that all by vision inside the game but now if you have some touch i bet you that would just make that experience even richer it's not necessary i suppose i'd rather play like uh marvel united you know where i'm like or i'm like hulking things i don't know i don't Mm. know i mean the bigger thing was that haptics was is really complicated and we think of haptics and it's a it's like a catch-all phrase for so many things with a sense of touch but it's not just touch sensation like we get touch on you know the tips of our fingers we get touch with force feedback we get touch with uh, temperature that's all haptics as well right so the the kind of force feedback that we want from like a ready player one scenario we're not i don't think we're going to get for a very very long time 
Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And so it's a matter of like choosing what's what's important for, for the want, user experience, for I the wonder, game experience. Like I don't even understand what technology would provide that. Yeah. It's so far out. Right. And we we've tried gloves in the past that provide resistance, mm -hmm. right? That kind of pull your fingers back, right? And that's that's force feedback, but, but that doesn't give you a sensation of touch. It's never enough. Right. And yeah. you need a combination of all these things. Yeah. I, I was compelled by the uh the whatever we tried at Oh, tactical, uh, tactical haptics. Yes. Yeah, the, the shear forces. Because that didn't try to tackle that problem. That was more of like an evolution of, of rumble and the, and the sense of like a gyro sense that you could get out of moving things in different directions. I and that, that, was, um, that was friction and... Yeah. Uh, what do you call that? The, the, the shear force, shear basically. Force, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, torsional forces, mm -hmm. which is simulated by vibration, essentially, yeah. on a lot of the current controllers. And vibration is just a cheap way of getting, uh, of simulating that, which is good enough for, I mean, for some, like, people have been very happy in VR pulling bow and arrows and feeling that, like, that quote-unquote resistance mm -hmm. just in the vibration because uh, your brain can be tricked. So it's a matter of, like, how much tricking do you need um, to, to make the experience that more, much more compelling. Do you have a video coming out about haptics? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A um, couple releases coming out this, uh, this and next week. Defector is coming out. Today, by the time you listen to this. Holy moly. Yeah, this is um, in the Oculus Store. This is from Twisted Pixel. It's the spy game. Like, they, they, I think when we played it last, they called it like they're trying to combine Jason Bourne and Fast and the Furious, an action spy adventure. It's only 20 bucks, so I'm really curious about this. We haven't played the full game yet, but yep. I'll be uh, getting that. Yeah. Uh, on uh, the Quest, Racket NX is coming out. We've on, played this. Yes. We've played Super it. excited. It's on the, Quest. It's great, dude. Like, the graphics are... I'm for me indistinguishable from the Rift. I'm really impressed. I mean, I always couldn't. I didn't have room to play it on my Rift. Yeah. In my play space. So and now. even if you do, that cable's no good. It's a 360 game, mm -hmm. and it's like continue. You're always spinning around. Uh, it, it's great multiplayer. Worked great for me and Norm, and it's super solid. I'm excited uh, for this to get out there. Um, and then uh, on the, the, I think it's only on the desktop side. Gorn, the full version, is coming out. This is the Gladiator combat game, the the melee game. A uh, little cartoon style, but it's super fun. This is a game I really want to. It's be coming in. to Quest. No, no, it's coming. Uh, the full version, the uh, the full release. What does that mean? It's coming you out. Know? Um, they haven't said. I mean, it's okay. the full polish, okay. you know, um, better levels and uh, out of out of basically the uh, the beta. Gotcha. Um, there's a game called Aerobots VR that's mm -hmm. doing some uh, some beta testing, and it's like an action shooter, but very. It's, you might like this. Very aggressive flying locomotion. Love it. Uh, they said they were definitely inspired by uh, Jet Island style of movement, really? which I know you love. I've never heard anybody say that. That's yeah. great. Yeah. All right. Um, and, and tribes in terms of the action. So big landscapes, lots of flying. Sweet. Is rocket this, launchers. This is multiplayer. Uh, multiplayer, and they're going to do alpha testing. So uh, on their Discord, people can request keys. This I, looks like that Richard Browning suit like, oh my God. In, turned into VR, except you can move fast. Wow. I formally request a key. <laughs> this looks amazing. I want to play this. Aerobots VR. Uh, and then uh, on the Microsoft side, people have noticed that Microsoft has been pulling availability of Windows uh, Mixed Reality headsets from their store to a point where the only headset you can get right now, Samsung, uh, Samsung Odyssey Plus. Um, and yeah, that's it. The, uh, the SUS VR headset is out of stock. So What does, what does that mean? Uh, the official Microsoft stance is that, you know, while the currently headset... the Headsets are out of stock. Um, select while select headsets are out of stock. The Odyssey Plus remains available. <laughs> the, the, the the their official statement is, okay. it is what it is. Okay. Speculation is either they are uh, really pulling away from supporting Windows Mixed Reality VR, uh, or they're gearing up for maybe a second generation. Meanwhile, consumers have pulled all of the Quests off the shelf. And you still can't find one of those. Really? It's like two to three weeks. Yeah. Do you don't, you don't know this? <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't check Amazon Daily for. When one is in stock anywhere, it, yeah. it gets a, a Reddit thread. All right. Yeah. We, I mean, we tried to order one for work, and they don't. They're not there. Wow. I, I heard that availability is a is a problem even internally at Facebook. I mean, it's it's yeah, got to be something they're, that they're, they're being sent to Amazon. That's right. It's it's got to be something that. They are both thrilled and frustrated by, and, you know, why not ramp up production? They've had, it's been out for 
a month. I have no idea. I mean, obviously the case is like even further out. Like you, like if you want an official Oculus Quest case, no. you're waiting until Thanksgiving. No way. I bought one two uh, a week and a half ago, and it came in two days. Off what? Off of the Oculus store? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe that, that those estimates were off base then. Yeah. No, that was that was ready available hmm. for me. Okay. Good. Uh, that does it for this week. God, went for two hours. Sorry about the coughing. I'm still recovering from the cold. I think we'll skip the Spider-Man spoilers for now. Oh, week. my gosh. No, dude. Oh. No, 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 Let's not skip it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it? Let's do... Um, Unless you have to go. No, no I know. Let, let's do an outro. Let, let's let's play outro music and do this as, as fake outros. And then, Kishore, if you wouldn't mind changing the light behind us. Uh, who do we have our outro from this week? It's from Wohawk. Wohawk. Thank you, Wohawk. All right, let's take a listen. Hi there. I didn't see you. Pass it. It was the cool place to be. Yeah. When computer labs started getting filled with set the tone, the 2000s, iPhone, iMacs, iPads, laptop, computer, MacBook, beige, by power book, utility, shell, expensive, beauty, Apple, 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 furniture, element, classic, iMac, laptop, what came next? Well, after that, G4, your home, glass, MacBook, air, <laughs> all metal, processing, titanium, volume, revolution, candy, could have plastic, the iPod, the iPod Mini, the iPod Nano, the iPod Shuffle, the Apple Watch, a storage media, Johnny Ipe. That's, it. That's wow. incredible. Norman Kishore's band coming to a local cafe soon. Yeah. Can we pay this guy to make one every week? That was <laughs> that was great. That was great. Well, we took the. You know, to be fair. And I'm assuming talk it, a lot about I, Apple yeah, last maybe week. you're a girl. I don't know. Maybe you're a woman. I have no idea. I, I got one of the RGBs to turn red. That's or that's fine. LGBs okay. We are now in spoiler territory. We're going to be talking about Spider-Man Far From Home, the 23rd film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Okay. Well, where do we begin? How about Jeremy? We had, when we watched the trailers. Dude, this is the about... last time you are spoiling a Marvel movie for me. Why? You guys both. What did we say? Like, well, everybody knows that this Mysterio is a bad guy. Like, everybody has, like, common knowledge. In it is common books. knowledge. It is pretty exactly. common Exactly, but you think everybody went to see this movie knew that? No. You gotta freaking let me be a filthy casual and enjoy these movies the way Marvel <laughs> wants me to. Nobody wanted people to know that that was a bad guy. Marvel knew. Mar oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Marvel knew. You knew. But no, 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 Marvel knew I didn't know. That's why the, all the trailers were structured that way. That's why the first act who, of the movie is structured that way. Who was the? Who do you think was the bad guy? Going in, with are the, you uh, serious? You think everybody went to see this movie knew he was a bad guy? Anyone who's a fan of Spider Man, <laughs> fine. <laughs> but most of the people, most of the millions of people who saw this movie are not comic book readers. Uh, it's it's more the factor that. We are now into like the low twenties of comic book movies in the Marvel <laughs> universe, and trailers have a certain kind of design to them. Uh -huh. That you see the hero, yeah, and that you see a villain. I thought the villain was the water demon. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> like that's what I was supposed to think, and I okay. thought that. Okay, fair, <clears throat> fair. Hydro we, Man we, and Molten Man. Okay, we, I, I, I listen to your feedback. We will mm -hmm. never yeah, discuss who is the hero or villain. Just don't 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 mind when Kishore and I give each other like these looks like <laughs> mm, mm, the big mm. wink. Yeah. yeah. I mean uh, really like Galactus. you guys hmm. if I went into that as I was supposed to I would have enjoyed it a lot more. And I think what? absolutely because that whole arc was ruined for me. Hey. And I will say you also tried to ruin the scrolls for me too. You tried to tell Wait, me whoa, that, whoa, that they that they oh. were good guys. And then when they were in Captain Marvel, like you're supposed to think they're bad guys, and I thankfully forgot all about that. I spent a year telling no, you Thanos was, was a, a big good guy, and you didn't <laughs> yeah. listen to me. So I mean, like, what are, what are we the, talking the about? The scrolls was a huge surprise for everyone. They subverted expectations with the scrolls in, in a big Captain way. Marvel. They and did, yeah. yeah. So because I thought you told me that they were not bad guys. No, they were. No, we said they're the bad guys. Oh, you did. They're okay. supposed we were, to be bad. Then guys. that yeah. explains why I forgot what like you didn't tell me. The big twist <laughs> is that the the Kree were oftentimes framed as good guys in the comics, sort of, huh. until they had a villainous turn. They framed them both uh, uh, as bad guys at times in the comics. So this was a real twist. Captain Marvel. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, you did ruin Star uh, Spider-Man for me. Well, uh, no problem. Th that was the thing. <laughs> we discussed 
with the scrolls being turned um, good, portrayed as you know they're they're the victims in Captain Marvel. There was a chance that they would do some another layer of subversion for Mysterio because Mysterio in the first trailer explicitly says he's from a different Earth, so a different time, no multiverse, d- d- multiverse. multiverse, a different Earth. Yes, like his version of Earth, and there's nothing to say that in this version of MCU, Mysterio could have been from a different Earth and could have been a good person there. So we were just laying out that's what the subversion could have been. So you, you actually thought maybe he was a good guy? I, actually, they, I thought they did a great job of, for the first like third of that movie for f- tricking fans of keeping the fans of comic books on their toes, yeah. not knowing how they were going to play Mysterio. And they played him straight like as a traditional comic book character at the end. But the, for the first half, until that bar scene when the holograms come down, yeah. I was like, oh, what are they doing here? Is this, I, is this really Mysterio or, or is it? Is this like an older Peter Parker who I, took on the mantle I, of his nemesis Mysterio and came hmm. into this earth? I, they had me until the Ferris wheel. Um, when the piece comes off. And I'm like, yes. oh, okay, yeah. we're playing yeah. this straight. Yeah. Uh, but like, I I thought it was, they, like for most of it, which is just turns out to be weird when we uh, as we talk about the spoilers, I thought the whole Mysterio thing is that he had replaced Nick Fury and, uh, and Maria Hill that whole time, and that was the real con happening, that, not all this that, like elemental stuff. That they were holographic projections? yeah. yeah. And he was using that to fake out Spider Man. I think if you watch this again, and but he I'm, did I'm, do that. He did it at one point. Once, yes. yes, 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 with the, the Euro pole. But at that point, it had already been kind of Euro revealed. Pole. You mean the acid trip when he goes to Berlin? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. when he goes to Berlin. Yeah. Uh, I I think what was sort of fascinating is I think if you go back and watch the movie, you'll see that Fury and Hill are weird. The, the, that the bothered whole, me the whole time. whole time. I was going to ask you about that. Like, do you think they played it differently? Yes, they did one hundred percent. And there there are lines of dialogue where if you listen to it again, uh, one she calls him Nick and not Fury. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Does. Yep. And two, she says when she's talking to Peter Parker about she says your Earth. Or your planet, yeah, as opposed to our planet. Oh. Uh, and then there's a mention of um, Cree sleeper cells. Have you seen this only once? Yes. Okay. I've, I live on the internet. <laughs> um, she mentions Cree sleeper cells, which is something, of course, they she would not have a lot of insight into. Wow. And just the cadence of their speech, like especially yeah. Sam Jackson's speech, is this like, you know, I'll get your ass. Like he's just more direct than Nick Fury. Do you ever want to explain like, for people who haven't seen it, who happen to be listening, why you're explaining this? Oh, because the post credit stinger, the last thing that's shown is in the car, and they did a really great reveal for this. Uh, Sam Jackson and Maria Hill are in the car, and Maria Hill turns into a freaking scroll. At that <laughs> moment, I'm like, what? She was a scroll the entire time through the whole MCU. And me too. I was like, oh, because sure it was right. And then yeah. <laughs> Sam Jackson turns into a scroll, and it's Talos. And it's Talos, and it turns out it's Talos and Soren from Captain Marvel, and it's just those two for this duration of the movie because they're out of play doing something else, which is theoretically into whatever Phase Four is happening. But so we believe though that the real Nick Fury, who's on whatever space station spaceship that is, yes. left after the funeral with Captain Marvel. Okay. Yeah, yes. I think like. I think that was definitely him in Endgame. Yes, he was there in the Endgame with Captain Marvel, and then afterward he went off to do some space stuff. So he'll and be set he up. He might in have space been stuff. off doing space stuff for a while, and then no, he was in Endgame. He, he was, was dusted. He was blipped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was. Thank you, blipped. I'm sorry, not dusted. We got to change our parlance now. Uh, the other thing is that he toys with his eye patch like throughout the film. It's, it's uncomfortable. Really? Oh, I yeah. didn't see that. He like kind of like uh, looks in the mirror and like hmm. yeah. Oh. But you also think that they that he evoked a different character? Yeah, like, the like confidence. A little more he, was, he was not as suspicious as Nick, Nick Fury's superpower is trust no one. Yeah. And he was so trusting. Oh, that's really, I mean, that is subtle stuff. It, it's great. It, 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 like the, the, the whole, and so like literally in the, during the credits, um, li- between the mid credits and the end credits, I turned over to Danica and Danica's like, I like that movie, but I didn't like Fury and... And Maria Hill, I thought they were just phoning it in, and then we saw the end, the post credit singer, and it explained everything. That's cool. Yeah. So let's talk about like the bulk of the film, though. Uh, Peter Tingle, how did we feel about oh, Spidey sins? I I thought it was both hilarious how they set it up, and then its use in the final battle is note perfect. 
Like, that's how it should be. It was the Matrix. Yeah, and... He was the one. And there's so many scenes in comics and in animated series where that's how he beats Mysterio, yeah. is doing exactly that. Yeah. Well, the same thing with that uh, middle of the movie scene where he goes on the acid trip and he gets, and it's that dark, like that is a very classic comic book scene where he's basically in this dreamscape, this nightmare scape that Mysterio has created for him through illusion. And the way that that was blended with the reality, with like things happening in reality or you know, not only being hit by the train, but like pulling the crane down and mm-hmm. running off the side of buildings. That was beautifully choreographed. Yeah. And, and uh, quite terrifying. How they explained Mysterio's helmet in oh. the context of the heads up oh, display. Yes. Beautiful. They explained beautiful. it? Well, you see him in that Berlin shot yeah. in real world torturing Spider Man, and he's wearing the globe. Which is like as a HUD, hit, as a heads yeah. up display. Is that how it is in the comics? No, no it's, it's always just... like he's a magician and yeah. like he's using oh. that to disguise himself, and it's all very. Strange. But what he's actually using in the movie is Stark tech that's developed by right. ex Stark employees. I thought that like little twist was was gorgeous. Is, is that his origin in the nope. comics? No, no, that was cra- that was perfectly manufactured for this film. Huh. The legacy of Tony Stark. Just like in Civil War, the legacy of Tony Stark being not just the heroism, but like pull back the curtain and all these people and that the don't like him. And the callbacks there, yeah, like oh. Peter Billingsley mm. going back to the first Iron Man movie. That's, uh, uh, what's the name from Christmas Story? Christmas Story. Peter yeah. Billingsley, yeah. And uh, yeah, the callbacks, like that there's a larger universe here of people that have been impacted by everything that's happening. That's like a, not a very comic thing to do, which I loved. Yeah. When Mysterio um, dies... Uh, one of his employees, I think I forget who it is. It was it's Peter Billingsley, one of the yeah. major guys, yeah. takes a USB stick out of the out of the. Computer. That presumably is the video that he sent ah, to J. Jonah yeah. Jameson. I gotcha. Which is now we were now on the J.K. Simmons multiverse because yeah, J.K. Simmons is back, and now he's a uh, Alex perfect. Jones type. It's perfect casting, and then Alex Jones play so good. So that was my one problem with with that is I understand you have to now after two movies. Spider-Man Begins, like he is now the Spider-Man from the comics. You had the classic. He earned the swing through New York City mm-hmm. after the course of two movies. Remember in the first movie, he was afraid of heights. Washington <laughs> Monument, he'd never been to the top of it, way higher than he'd expected. Uh, he never did a New York swing scene that you saw like all throughout the Tobey Maguire and um, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies. It was only the end of this one, he did the, the classic Swing through the city, takes a selfie. Maybe that's homage to the Spider-Man 4 video game, um, the PS4 video game. He does an MJ swing scene, which is great. Like She's terrified. That's a great take on it. It's yeah. not to the, mm-hmm. the Kristen Dunst like, holding a mannequin, swinging through the city stuff. Um, oh, I, I thought of Superman when... when oh, when Lois Lane. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. classic. It's, it's like you have your classic. He's earned. He's become the character. So he's like the suit. No longer the Spider-Man armor suit, which I thought didn't look that great in the opening parts of this movie. Actually, I thought most of the suits did not look good in this movie. Uh, but then you have Spider-Man Menace, right? And that's a classic Spider-Man's like trope, where the city thinks of him as the villain as opposed to a hero. I get how that can work on the no, comics. No, the city loves him. The media thinks he's. A but villain. can that work in an MCU world post Endgame, where guys, he's an Avenger? You need to explain what happened. Well, J. Jonah Jameson reveals to the world that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. Yeah, through footage from Mysterio. Yeah, and and distorts Spider-Man's, the footage to make it look like Spider-Man sent the attack uh, on London. So I actually think it's uh, revealing the the identity in that way is kind of an interesting setup. They can go a million ways with it. Uh, I actually didn't like how he kept revealing his identity to people throughout the film, though. Like I think I love how MJ is portrayed by Zendaya. It's a really different take on the character. She's great, but I don't think he's earned in their relationship revealing that he's Peter Parker to her yet. Mm. You mean and that's Spider-Man. like a big deal? He tried not to. And there's always been storylines where there's something in the way of him revealing his identity to her uh, because there's something at stake when she knows. I th- I thought that was a good moment though because he, you think that's going to happen and he tries very hard to deny that he's Spider-Man and then he they, re- realizes his colossal mistake and he just says, what am I going to do now? And he just lets it all spill. I mean, they secret play- identities are are done. They were this the, the one of the biggest themes in comic books the but it's such a huge part of who spider-man is like it's his, it that's to be why though? uncle ben is dead right eh? why, why? no no he, uncle ben's dead because he was reckless 
Yeah, but the part of that, that's why he's so protective of people is how reckless he was. But he's, and so revealing who he is to all these people opened them up to the danger. I feel like it's a little too on the nose for everybody knowing that he's uh, Peter Parker's Spider-Man. If this is true, it, it seems like this movie was an arc of Peter Parker lacking confidence to becoming the Tony Stark. Of, of the Marvel Universe. A, a version, a successor, a, a worthy successor. And everybody knew who Iron Man was. Yes, and that definitely is a, a direct parallel, where when Tony Stark announced he was Iron Man, it was a game-changing thing for superheroes yeah. in, in any medium. Um, and you've got uh, Peter Parker creating his own suit, and oh yeah, direct callbacks. And and uh, what's his name from Swingers? <laughs> John Favreau. John Favreau is like appreciating that and seeing Tony ACDC, Stark. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I I like that we got peaks of brilliant Spider-Man, like brilliant Peter Parker. That he's a smart kid. We didn't really get that, I think, in Homecoming as much. Uh, so that was nice. Yeah. I didn't think the um, all the kid stuff like Flash and Flash Thompson and oh, that's and his so friend. fun going forward. Yeah, I, I don't think it actually played that well in this movie. What are you talking about? Who's Flash? Flash is the guy that's on social media all the I, time. I thought what, what made that work was the end, when mm-hmm. his parents didn't show up to pick him up. There's something there. There I must be something there. Yeah, yeah but I, I don't, don't know, remember yeah, anything yeah, with Flash's mom. What is, what is that mom. thread? I don't know. Yeah. They did not set up any future Spider-Man villains. We, we don't see any hints, right? Well, the Ooh, director has go. said that if he was allowed to make another one and I'm sure they're going to let him make another one that one villain he'd love to do and I think would tie really perfectly well with this new world where Spider-Man is maybe a, a, a menace and maybe in, someone will be in pursuit of him is he wants to do Craven. that is Craven the Hunter Spider-Man I think if you do hunted a, down a Craven, which can be done uh, there has to be a larger story about a backlash against superheroes overall in the, oh, yeah, he would have to world. be a bounty hunter, not a jungle hunter. You mean like the Incredibles kind of thing? Yes. Hmm. Like, think of that superheroes outlawed, but outlawed where they find these superpowered bounty hunters to track and hunt them down. And I, that those people I feel will like take it's pleasure too in it. early because if you're going to do that storyline, that storyline is awesome if the X Men are around. Yes, I think they, they can still get around that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're going to do Green Goblin. I think they're. That doesn't make a lot of sense for the Spider-Man. There's no existing relationship. There's no Sinister Osborne. Six was set up in the f- previous movie, so I feel like they could do something. How how was because the uh, Vulture was talking to oh yes um, the lizard, not the lizard. Um, Shocker. Uh, no, the guy that shoots like venom out of his tail was in the Scorpion. Prison. Scorpion. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and there was a Shocker, and uh, uh, and there was Shocker. Yes. Yeah. So there, I feel like there is something there. Mm. I thought it was a good movie. I, I stand by what we said in the beginning. I thought it was good. I think coming, it, it felt like a good palate cleanser from Endgame. The stakes weren't like world. The world wasn't at stake. Um, I thought Jake Gyllenhaal is a very memorable character. I thought he did really well as yeah. Mysterio. I did too. Did you guys know like in the last Spider-Man that MJ was going to be his girlfriend because she's MJ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's yeah. MJ. Yeah, she's MJ. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, I, you always kind of assume that that's where it's going to go, but, but she, like, if she'd been Mary Jane, like I would have gotten it, but it was too subtle for me. Mm. Yeah, really? That's yep. Connecting nope. MJ Mary nope. Jane didn't get there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they really, really, really should not have spoiled Mysterio for no, you. No, I'm telling you. Yeah, that would have been a big surprise. Uh, all right, we're done with our spoiler talk. We'll be uh, back. Kishore and I, I think we'll be back next week, or maybe you know what? We're not leaving till I'm not leaving till Thursday. I think we can get another podcast in. Oh, we might be able to. I yeah. thought you were going to do it from Comic Con. No, let's let's let's. I'm not I'm not going to be there uh, till Thursday. Okay, well I won't be here. I'm, oh. I'm leaving Sunday. Well, yeah. Then maybe well, we will well maybe we will. Uh, and we have a lot of friends at Comic Con. Maybe we can yeah. find an interesting yeah. amalgam of people. Yes, uh, a lot of cool stuff on the site. Again, if you haven't followed Project Egress, uh, we have links on uh, test.com or you can just search Project Egress Smithsonian and go ahead download those STL files because you could print out your own Apollo. A hatch right now yeah. yeah because you have a 3d printer i mean or <laughs> if you have a 3d printer you could print one out right now all right thanks for listening we'll see you next time bye, bye.